Metro Hudson Prism meeting uh, for July. I'm Linda Rolleder, the coordinator for the Lower Hudson Prism. We'll get started. Um, first, I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting today. Uh, we've got a really nice turnout and I'm sure there'll be more people joining as we go through the next few minutes. I wanna start out with some announcements uh, primarily for Lower Hudson Prism partners. Um, we have had some partner representative changes. Clarkson University Beacon Institute for Rivers and Estuaries, Rebecca Rue has left. Uh, the new partner representative is Bridget Walsh and her email is there for, um, for our Lower Hudson Prison partners. Ryan Nature Center, Danny Molinero has left there and we do not have a, a replacement for him, although, um, uh, Gennaro Ferraro is still there at Rye Nature Center as a contact. Um, the updated contact list is posted on the partner portal under organizational documents. Hopefully you all have gotten your invite to that part partner portal and um, connected. Uh, so the partner portal is an access restricted area of the Lower Hudson Prism website for PRISM partners only. Um, it's accessed through the Lower Hudson PRISM slash partners webpage. And it's actually a SharePoint site where we have PRISM documents, reference materials, meeting notes from our working groups, um, working group discussion forums and species specific information collections as we sort through all the information that is out there for specific species and decide um, what we wanna put in our BMPs and what we want to make public. Um, if you have trouble getting connected partners, uh, please let me know uh, so that I can help you work through that process. This is uh, to be a very valuable resource area. Um, and, got, uh, okay. Um, so please let me know if you have trouble getting connected. Also, the Lower Hudson Prism Steering Committee is responsible for, um, for helping the coordinator and the Lower Hudson Prism in general, uh, guiding our, uh, our activities and making decisions on the allocation of our funds. Um, so this is our 2020 Steering Committee. Uh, Jan Lerner, Tom Lewis, Carrie Van Camp, Matt Aiello Lamins, Taro Iataka, and Bud Viverka. Um, the Jen Le Lerner's and Tom Lewis's uh, seats uh, terms are ending in the end of this year. And so we will, at our fall meeting, be electing representatives for the, uh, those two seats. Um, the, you must be a Lower Hudson Prism partner to be on the steering committee. And uh, we elect two new, uh, new, two new representatives every year so that we have continuity. Uh, so the steering committee members are elected for three years, um, but they can, uh, you know, they can uh, resign if they find that their workload is, is uh, too much to continue or whatever. Um, and if you are interested, and like to know more about being a steering committee member, uh, talk to any one of our steering committee members here and you can talk to us about how much of a time commitment and what actually you would be doing. I do wanna say that the steering committee for 2022 is going to be especially important since this will be the last year of the PRISM contract. It's a five-year contract. And there would be the potential of an application for renewal that would happen during next year. So steering committee guidance would be critical during that period. Um, so if you really want to play a role in the direction of the steering committee and the direction of the prism, um, be great to be part of the steering committee. Um, all right. That also means for our other Lower Hudson Prism partners that our fall meeting will be a voting meeting. So it will be very important for you to try to attend or to designate a proxy to vote for you. Um, all right. Some good news. Uh, the Lower Hudson Prism participated in the Stewardship Network's Spring Challenge 2021. This is, uh, the Stewardship Network is very much like our PRISM. It's a collection of different organizations that are doing stewardship work. 
and it's coordinated by central coordination, uh, similar to my function, uh, but it's primarily in the Midwest, but they've been expanding to New England and elsewhere. Um, they've approached the New York prisms to sort of uh, network with us. And each year they run a spring challenge where groups report the pounds of invasive species that are removed. It started out as a garlic mustard poll, but it's expanded um, to, to be include other species. So uh, I sent the challenge out on our listserv, and I know many of you were reporting your invasive species removed during the spring. And the Lower Hudson Prism won uh, our category again. We won in 2019, and so we, we won again this year. So yay, everybody, give yourselves a hand. Um, you know, great job. Um, and hopefully we can keep up this streak and uh, we'll, we'll begin seeing uh, impact in our, our region from all of this invasive species removal. Okay, also, uh, we're trying to recruit IMAP invasives confirmers. Anybody uh, can do this if you're knowledgeable about any particular species uh, that you feel like you can identify well. Uh, we need to get more records confirmed in IMAP invasives. If you just enter a record into IMAP invasives, it goes in as unconfirmed. Uh, if you include a photo, that really gives us the opportunity to confirm it because we can look at the photo and we can make an evaluation of uh, whether uh, that identification is correct and can be confirmed. So please, when you enter a record, make sure that if you can to include a photo. Um, we could have interns focus on checking a small subset of species, maybe one tier two species or others doing ground checking of those observations. Uh, land managers or volunteers to ground truth the observations in your park. Um, we need more people to sign up. So there is a recorded training session so that you can sign up to learn how to confirm records. And that's posted on the New York IMAP, IMAP Invasives uh, website. The URL is here on the screen uh, where you can take that recorded training to learn how to confirm, get set up to confirm records and go out and do some confirming. Uh, so we'd love to have anybody that's on this call or any of your volunteers or interns uh, participate in confirming in some way. Um, so please consider doing that. Also, um, the Plant Invaders of the Mid-Atlantic, a very good resource book, uh, is going through an update and they're going to be printing the sixth version of this. Um, and they're going to do one bulk printing. Um, you can purchase them only by the box. There are 50 books in a box. The estimate is going to be about $6 per book or less. The bigger the order they get, the lower the cost will be per book. Um, so it's going to be a big bulk order. Uh, anybody can be part of this bulk order. Um, so if you have a store where you sell things and you would like to order some of these to sell, or if you um, want to order a bunch for your volunteers, uh, this is something to consider. The orders are due August 13th. I have the email with the link to the order form. Uh, if you have not yet received it, I think I did send it out on the listserv, but if you have not yet received it, please just put in the chat um, for me to send it to you. Um, you know, send me the order form for the Plant Invaders book, and I will make sure to send it to you. Again, orders are due by August 13th. Uh, warning here is they usually do one big bulk printing and then another one does not happen for many years. So it's, a, it's almost like a one-time opportunity. So really consider that. Um, okay, next topic is beech leaf disease nematode. Um, we are seeing increasing numbers of infestations. Uh, this year, we've seen two new counties in our region added to the infestation area, Putnam County and the Bronx. 
Um, and so we are also getting many reports from New Jersey in multiple different counties. Uh, so, you know, keep your eyes open for this and please do record this. It's got a very distinctive look to the leaf where these dark bands show uh, up on the leaf. Um, okay. Uh, also, our July EcoQuest focused, it, focused on this species. So that's where some of the records have been coming from. Uh, we use uh, a challenge every month uh, focused on a specific species through iNaturalist. Right, uh, spotted lanternfly distribution map has updated. Uh, this is from the New York State IPM website, and I'm not going to say too much about this because Tom is going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, uh, confirmed locations, I'm going to skip that because Tom will give us more updated information. Uh, and this is uh, the slide from our previous meeting about supplies that may be available through Department of Ag and Markets. I know some of the things have run out. Some of them are, are still available. Um, this poster is a very large poster on very on thick plastic that's available to borrow from the PRISM if you would like to use it for tabling events. Um, we have these wallet cards as well uh, that are lamp, sort of uh, plastic wallet size cards, credit card size cards um, to hand out uh, to people. Um, so several things there that are available. And now I'd like to uh, move the floor on to Tom Algar. Tom's from the Department of Ag and Markets. And he's going to give us an update on the uh, spy lanternfly uh, infestation and response efforts. So I'll stop my share now. And Tom, you can share your screen. And Tom, I think you're still muted, uh, so I haven't. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. All right. I was trying to unmute myself on the phone, not the computer. So, <laughs> <laughs> can you see the uh, screen? I can see the screen. Yes. All right. Um, getting a security thing. There we go. Yeah, and you can still see it, right? Yes. Yeah, I see okay. your presentation. Yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm Tom Algeyer. For those of you that don't know me, um, I hope most of you do know me. Um, I am the Invasive Species Coordinator with New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, housed within the Division of Plant Industry. So we kind of focus on plant pests and diseases versus some of the animal issues. Um, so this is a little different than, than my typical spotted lanternfly update. Um, this is more really going to concentrate on our response moving forward currently and moving forward. So um, my map is a little out of date compared to, uh, I didn't update the map, sorry. Um, I believe there was one county in West Virginia that was added. Uh, I think that was the only addition. But in New York, it has not changed. Um, the little reddish maroon dots are kind of one-offs that were either dead insects or, or, or one find with no population. The blue areas uh, in New York and the other states as well are areas where populations have been found in the environment. Um, the, you know, the, the big blue area is kind of daunting. It looks shocking. But keep in mind that if a very small area of a county has a population, the whole county is shaded in. So it's not, it, you know, it's not as dire as the, the map makes you think. Um, it's not spread throughout this entire area. There are pockets within these counties. Um, so like if Tompkins County is lit up, it's a very, very small area on the Ithaca Cornell, uh, on the Cornell campus in Ithaca. Um, so it's not the entire county of Tompkins County. Just kind of, just trying to interpret the map a little bit so people don't, aren't too shocked by what they see. 
Um, when you zoom into New York, um, these are the positive finds we've had uh, for, for populations. And you can see kind of the, the area there near Lower Hudson Prism. Uh, and also for Lisma, it's kind of a hot spot. Uh, uh, zooming in a little bit further, uh, you can see the survey efforts. The, uh, the white circles were surveyed done by USDA. The, the, the green, both the light and dark green, are, are survey areas by uh, state personnel. And then also the red areas are positive. So there's quite a few positives um, in Staten Island. And then one or two that were kind of one-offs in Brooklyn and Queens. And then uh, there was one reported adult in Nassau County, but there was no population there. And we did extensive survey in that area, um, as you can see by the cluster of little bubbles, and nothing was found there. Uh, when you kind of head up the Hudson a little bit, um, on the left side there, you can see the area around uh, Port Jervis. Uh, there were a, few, a couple of positive finds. The, the larger red dots were actually finds from the USDA. The smaller ones were state personnel. So the, there was a few in Port Jervis. Uh, we ext surveyed extensively. Uh, currently, we're addressing that. We, we thought it would be a smaller infestation than it is. It has we have found them a little bit further out than we expected last fall. And then uh, Orangeburg and then Slotesburg. Uh, you can see the area there uh, to the right. Uh, again, extensive survey around the areas, but limited in, in scope. You know, it's not the entire county. It's, uh, it's really just around those areas, Orangeburg and Slotesburg. Um, if you look off to the right, though, there's a lot of survey and only one red dot. That red dot is just a few in advance. Um, it's just a, literally a, maybe 75, 100 feet over the state line into Connecticut. Um, so there was some egg masses and there was some nymphs found this spring. The egg mass was found last fall. The nymphs were found, found this spring. Uh, no adults yet, uh, nothing on the New York side. But we've heavily surveyed the entire area. Um, Currently, New York State Parks is working with the Thruway Authority. Oh, sorry, uh, this is Westchester, sorry. Um, so Westchester County Airport is really what we're calling it. Um, the USDA is trying to spray on the Connecticut side um, because we can't cross the state line and also because of the, the state uh, environmental quality review, uh, we're kind of we're, we're stuck in a holding pattern until that environmental quality review is completed, at least for ag and markets. Um, so that's the Westchester County Airport. And we're addressing each one of these locations separately. There is not one plan, one fits all plan that we're trying to, you know, hammer a square peg into a round hole for all of New York State. Uh, we're really addressing each population separately. So. Um, again, currently monitoring here, surveying, and then also uh, working cooperatively with the USDA to get the Connecticut side treated now that we found NIMPS. On the Orangeburg site, uh, we've had a lot of help from prison partners down there uh, and also New York State Parks and Thruway Authority as well. Uh, the, the core area is, is really where we've been finding them, but there is along that rail trail um, kind of heading to the, the southeast, uh, there was, I believe, there was a, an egg mass that was found further down the trail. Uh, the concentric rings are, um, are basically just levels of survey. Uh, the core area is surveyed 100%, and then, and then it lessens as we go out. Um, New York State... You know, just because we've we've surveyed an area does not mean by any means. I mean, sometimes we're surveying the same area two, three days in a row, and we we won't find results, and then two days later we'll find nymphs. Uh, they are moving around, and the same thing with eggs. Uh, you know, we've surveyed areas, not found anything on a cloudy, kind of overcast day, and then gone back on a sunny day and found eggs. Um, it, they're very difficult to detect, especially when they're on the underside of objects and things like that. So we're heavily surveying this area. We're also putting out traps. 
in uh, basically two different schemes, and, and Lower Hudson Prism is going to help with some of that. There are bag traps, um, so it's like a, a cloth mesh bag that kind of funnels in, and then the, the, the adults and nymphs will kind of collect in the bags. Uh, the other trap is similar to what we've used a couple of years ago, uh, the sticky bands. But we, we got away from the sticky bands because of bycatch issues with, with birds and squirrels and chipmunks. Um, uh, not that we really had much bycatch, but other states did. So before it became problematic, we kind of discontinued those traps. And then the other trap that we adopted in lieu of that is a uh, bug barrier. So it's, a, it's still a sticky band, but it has a protective um, barrier that the other animals can kind of cross over without the insects, um, you know, the, and the insects don't do that. Um, we'll be distributing both traps. Uh, the, the, the bag traps are already in our distribution location in West Hampton Beach. Early next week, they should be um, delivered to, West, uh, to Lower Hudson Prism. Uh, we're talking about 100 traps. We'll have other traps in reserve. Those traps will be placed um, kind of in that in that middle zone where we know there's some population, uh, you know, the outer edge of the pink zone. We we know there's population there, but we want to see just how far out it is with these traps. The sticky bands, however, are going to be placed closer in, right around the areas where the red dots are, with the intent of of at least we're not going to stop them, but at least we'll we'll put a dent in the population. We can't apply pesticides right now because the the state environmental quality review um, is still underway. Until we've passed that, we can't apply any pesticides. Uh, when I say we, I mean ag and markets. And um, so this is kind of a next best effort is to, to use these uh, bug barriers to, to at least collect some of the nymphs and some of the adults. At least um, you know, something is better than nothing situation. Uh, Slotesburg, uh, it's primarily a, a throughway and New York State Parks uh, property. It's right near the rest stop. You can see all the red marks there. Um, now, the the two that are up further north were relatively recent finds. Prior to that, everything was clo clustered closer further south, closer to the actual rest area. Um, still not very widespread. We've done a lot more survey than what this map really shows just because we've surveyed those same one kilometer grids repeatedly. Um, in Slotesburg, the management plan for right now is that uh, New York, uh, sorry, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation have passed a seeker review and they are able to apply uh, some pesticides. So um, last week, the trees that were above six inches or below six inches were tagged with flagging tape, depending on the color, the size of the tree, they use two different color tapes. So if you're in this area and you see trees that are flagged, um, it's basically just designating whether they're, they're over six inches of diameter at breast height or below six inches in diameter at breast height. Um, those treatments will happen as, as weather and personnel allow. Um, and that, like I said, that's not being conducted by Ag and Market staff. That is being done by New York State Parks because they've already gone through the seeker process, so they're kind of clear for their agency. And it's their their resources, not ours. Um, they're they're just kind of uh, making us abreast of what they're doing, but we are coordinating with them. So, in Port Jervis, again, a, a much smaller site, but we did find some nymphs a little further out than we had originally found, originally thought um, this spring. So we're continuing a lot of survey effort in this area. You can see all the green dots. The smaller green dots are uh, areas that we've we've either surveyed more than once or, or, or we're currently surveying now. Um, a lot of high target areas in that area, a lot of uh, retail centers, a lot of um, disturbed areas where there's a lot of Atlantis. Uh, so we're we're kind of targeting that as well, and, I, and Lower Hudson Prism will also be using some of those traps in this area as well. And I believe it's County Road 80, I believe, is the dividing line, or it might be I-84, um, is the dividing line between CRISP and Lower Hudson Prisms. 
about 209. 209? Okay. Yeah. So, which kind of divides the Port Jervis area, but uh, you know, that Crisp is aware of what we're doing and what's going on there as well. Um, but Lower Hudson definitely has a, a much bigger uh, volunteer footprint than Crisp. Uh, the Ithaca area, again, um, another approach was taken in, in Ithaca. It was a very small area, just a few trees and a scrubby kind of overgrown area in, adjacent to a parking lot, kind of between a parking lot and some of the Greek life community buildings that are privately owned. So the campus is public, and then the, the campus life buildings were private. Uh, so we've worked with the, the, the city forester and uh, – and their crews removed the trees that were, and we're not talking big majestic trees, we're talking scrubby woodlot trees. Um, so they removed the Atlantis trees and some other high risk trees. Um, also cleaned up the area aesthetically, it definitely made it better. Um, those chips, once it's chipped, the, the egg, the survivability of the eggs are, are almost nil. Um, but those egg sites, the egg sites, the wood chips were bring, brought to a uh, disposal site, and the disposal site will also be monitored. Um, we've gone back multiple times um, since the trees were removed looking for nymphs. Uh, about 60 nymphs were found in the area, um, and there were also one egg mass found on one of the stumps after the trees were removed. Um, so the eggs were, egg masses were scraped from the stump. Uh, I believe the stumps have since been removed. Um, and again, when we went back to survey and we did find nymphs, so that triggered more survey. We're also probably going to be trapping um, a little bit in the Ithaca area, but not as extensively as Port Jervis and uh, Orangeburg. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on yesterday, uh, Penn State gave a, a pretty good update on spotted lanternfly in New Jersey, uh, sorry, in Pennsylvania. And I stole this from them. <laughs> um, it, it, I cover the life cycle quite a bit, but right now we're kind of in this transition period between the fourth instars and the adults. So we can still see um, third instars at this stage, um, but primarily what we're seeing is the fourth instar nymphs. So the, the nymphs with the red wing pads, they're starting to turn red. They're much easier to spot in the environment. They're a little bit larger, they're about the size of a dime. And then we've also started seeing in Sloth, uh, in Orangeburg at least, started seeing adults. And I believe there was a report of an adult in Staten Island as well. Um, we had kind of predicted that it would move from the southern part of the state up, but um, the biology and insects didn't cooperate. And our, the first adults that we've that were reported were in the uh, Slotesburg, sorry, Orangeburg area, one of which was reported, I believe it was the first one, adult, for the year was reported by um, a Lower Hudson Prison volunteer, and it was actually reported, I think, three times. I think the situation there is that spotted lanternfly is a confidential species, just like Asian longhorn beetle, because there's some regulatory concerns. So it can be reported in IMAP, but the public cannot see it. So I, I, I just keep in mind that if you make a report and you don't see it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not there. It's just that it's, 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 uh, it's in a shaded or protected view. So uh, internal staff can see it, uh, parks. Um, I believe Linda can also see those confidential reports. Myself, um, I don't know who the designated person is at the DEC at this point. It was Molly, but she's no longer there. She's taken another position within DEC. So there's a very limited number of people that can see these confidential reports. Um, so if you, if you do report it, you don't have to report it multiple times. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, uh, and currently, you know, what we're looking for is, is emergence of adults and also fourth instar nymphs. Although you may store, see kind of a few of the third instars, um, not too many of those around. And, uh, basically for the rest of the summer until the fall, we're basically looking for adults. Um, here's a good view of what you would find on an Atlantis tree. Uh, especially right now, you see a couple of the black and white 
third instar nymphs that are almost the size of the fourth instar, and then several, I think there's one all the way off to the left there, there's one right in the center. I think there's four, four, four fourth instar nymphs in this photo, but the one all the way off to the left is hard to see. It's kind of behind that other stem. Um, so this is really what you'd spot in the field. They're starting to congregate at this point. Um, the earlier instar nymphs are very uh, widely dispersed in the environment. They don't really cluster together other than the first few moments when they hatch out of their eggs, and then they disperse themselves, and they're so tiny, tick-like. Um, they're about the size of the, the dot and the R in my presentation where it says New York State of Opportunity. The, the little white part of the R, that's about the size of the tick uh, nymphs, you know, very much tick-like when they, when they first emerge. But at this point, they're about dime size, much easier to spot in the environment, and that red wing pad and that red coloring uh, really, really stands out, um, as you can see, yeah, especially on a, 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 an opposing color background. You know, what is that? You know, it doesn't look like many things in the environment. It really sticks out. Here it is again on the railing. And I believe these pictures were taken in, in Orangeburg. Um, so my contact information is here. Um, you can always reach me through Linda. Um, email is probably best. Uh, if you have an insect report, uh, that would be through uh, Spotterlandfly uh, at um, yeah Spotterlandfly at agonmarkets.ny.gov, uh, and also through IMAP. Uh, either one of those, if you, if you put it into IMAP, there's a, there's a slight delay in like 24 hours before we see it, um, but we can evaluate those. And as Linda mentioned earlier, um, include photos, include a description, um, time of day, weather, anything like that helps, uh, you know, especially with the, with, if it's an egg mass, if you mention that, you know, the, what the weather conditions were like. I don't mean, you know, three inches of rain, but you could say whether it was an overcast day or a clear day. Um, it just makes it, you know, if you saw it on a, on a bright, clear day and we go back and it's a cloudy day and we can't find it, we know the reason why we can't find it is more than likely that it's just, you know, the, the lighting is bad and we can't find it. Um, hey, Tom, uh, do you want to mention the um, new find in Orange County or not? Um, yes, I can bring that up. There was a find, a confirmed find in Newburgh. Um, that we, that were uh, nymphs. I, I, I thought it was an adult. It was actually nymphs. Uh, so we're we're also kind of trying to evaluate where that is, you know, how far out it spread. Uh, currently, it's very limited. Uh, it's it's a private property. We it's a uh, it's a rest area, truck stop situation uh, in Newburgh. Uh, so we're we're working with the property owner to get permission to put up traps and and a survey and all that. Um, which we've had no issues with whatsoever. So we're we're continuing to monitor that and see how far out and, and see if it's just a one-off thing. I know our inspectors were there yesterday, and the one area where they found five or six nymphs uh, was about four feet where trucks were backed in and parked. Um, so we suspect this was an introduction from a, a hitchhiker, uh, you know, over-the-road trucks kind of backing in, parking, switching trailers, resting, getting, you know, food and whatnot, um, and then driving off. Well, likely, you know, there's no way to prove this 100%, but likely what happened was one of these trucks had an egg mass that hatched and moved the, to the adjacent, you know, uh, environment. Um, so we're monitoring that really closely. We think it's very limited to that specific site. Uh, so, you know, it, we don't have a lot of information there for Newburgh, but yes, there was a con confirmed uh, you know, environmental find in, in Newburgh, but we just don't know the extent at this point. Very right, good. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Tom. Um, we uh... There's a question in the chat about are there any treatment plans for Staten Island? Um, we're kind of working with our New York City partners, and I, I don't believe New York City is has any plans on treating Staten Island. Um, the Lower Hudson Prism has uh, plans and efforts going on for Orangeburg. We'll get involved in uh, Port Jervis and, and New
Newburgh if necessary. Um, and uh, the, the town of uh, Orangeburg is um, going, likely uh, going to help us with some treatments. We're, going, we're still working on that. Um, so let's move to the next part of our uh, meeting. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rockland County has a interim presentation. Uh, Kristen, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Okay. If anyone has any further questions for Tom, you can put them in the chat. Um, and I will be informing Lower Hudson Prison Partners about what our efforts are in Orangeburg via the listserv. Thank you. Um, so my, the interns I'm working with um, are actually out in the field. They are out doing outreach for a sod lantern fly in the Rockland community today. So they put together a presentation to share. Itself. I'm 20 years old. And Sorry, hold on. I have to get from the beginning. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know why it's going to start. Of, it's going to skip the first slide. Sorry. So we'll just start with Heather's. And I'll be a junior in the fall at Cornell. Um, you need to reshare. Majoring. Hello. Marcus. What? You can't see it? No, you need to share your screen again. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> and, and we even did a practice run. Good afternoon. My name is Heather and I'm an intern with the Spotted Lantern Fly Internship at the Rockland Cornell Cooperative Extension. Today, my partner and I will be giving an overview on the work we've been doing during our time here to help with the invasive species issue. A little bit about myself. I'm 20 years old and I'll be a junior in the fall at Cornell University. I'm an undergraduate majoring in animal science with a minor in entomology. My interest in entomology was one of the main factors that drew me towards this opportunity. I have a fascination with bugs that I supplement in my free time as a hobby. Some of my other hobbies include playing different musical instruments and writing poetry. Hello, my name is Marco Octaviano. I am currently 20 years old and I'm going to be entering my final year of Manhattan College this fall. I have a strong interest in animals, the biology, and connection to nature, which has led me to pursue a major in biology. In my free time, I enjoy listening to and talking about music as well as drawing. Marcus and I were connected to this internship through the organization Rockland Conservation Service Corps. The RCSC provides an internship where college age young people spend the summer doing environmental service projects in the community. We learn skills like plant identification, trail building, sustainable agriculture, ecology, river infrastructure, and many others. We also receive placement at a site in smaller groups where we do 250 hours of service work. Marcus and I received our site placement here at the Cooperative Extension according to our unique strengths and interests. At the Cornell Cooperative Extension, Marcus and I are specifically dealing with the invasive spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven with a major goal of spreading awareness in the community through educational outreach, as well as aiding in the documentation of the spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven instances across the county. Part of our goal in outreach is to make the community aware of the dangers of invasive species. For example, we might say something to the public about how invasive species disrupt the delicate ecology of the land around us and threaten other plants and animals and how SLF is especially harmful to agriculture on the East Coast of the United States. 
A major focus in outreach is to spread information about the spotted lanternfly to the public. We explain that the spotted lanternfly is an invasive insect originating from Asia that has recently shown up along the east coast of the United States. In recent years, populations of spotted lanternfly have been sighted in counties across New York, including Rockland County. We tell people how the spotted lanternfly poses a significant threat to New York State agriculture to feeding on crops such as apples, grapes, and hops which can greatly decrease crop yield or even cause crop failure. And that they also produce a sticky black mold that attracts other swarming insects, further harming the plant and hindering the quality of life in our outdoor recreational spaces. The Tree of Heaven is another invasive species originally from Asia, serving as a major food source for the spotted lens of fly, which makes it another important invasive to spread awareness about. When people ask us whether they can spot a spotted lens of fly, we mention the Tree of Heaven explain to them how this tree is of special interest to us because of its relationship with spotted lanternfly and how it likes to grow in disturbed areas and can be difficult to remove once established. Instances of tree of heaven can serve as an indicator where populations of spotted lanternfly may be spotted, which is why we have kept a special eye out for tree of heaven instances during our surveying and tell others to keep an eye out for tree of heaven when looking for spotted lanternfly. In outreach and our own work, it's important for people to know how these invasive issues begin. For SLF, we make a point of explaining to people that the species is actually native to Asia and was speculated to be brought over on lumber. Letting people know that the infestation is out of control in Pennsylvania already and that there are very severe economic losses there encourages them to care more deeply about the issue here. It's also important for people to be generally informed that ecological issues affect life outside of the natural world in important ways. One of our main tasks in this internship is to survey areas in Rockland County and record the presence of Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. We use the application IMAP Invasives to catalog this data. Now that Marcus and I have completed our, the virtual training and downloaded the app onto our phones, we are able to go to different sites and catalog instances of invasives. A sample screenshot is shown in the center of how the app appears to us on our devices. The picture on the right shows areas of Rockland Lake that we surveyed. IMAP Invasives uses ArcGIS and grid squares to organize land. We concentrated our efforts on grid squares that were designated as needing surveying and claimed them through the website. The square highlighted in red includes the grid squares we surveyed from Rockland Lake. We also surveyed Bear Mountain and Lowe's in Orangeburg. These areas have been surveyed over the course of five weeks. We learned that each square can take a variable amount of time to survey, depending on the kind of land, the area of parking lots, and the quantity of Tree of Heaven. Currently, we have completed surveying all of the grid squares that were designated as needing surveying in Rockland County. Bear Mountain was the first place we ever surveyed and brought us a bit of a learning curve. In the beginning, we were unsure how thorough to be with our search or where exactly to concentrate our efforts. We began with benches and doing in-depth scans of bushes, which we now know is not the most efficient method for surveying. We were, when we returned to Bear Mountain to finish after visiting the infestation in Orangeburg, we understood much better that locating Tree of Heaven and Wild Grape first would be much more efficient, as well as concentrating our efforts around parking lots. Soon after our initial surveying at Bear Mountain, we surveyed the lowest point movement store in Orangeburg. This location was previously surveyed where a confirmed population of spotted lanternfly egg masses were reported. We came in early June with our supervisor, Kristen Osman, where she trained us on how to identify spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven and how to reassess the established population, which greatly aided us in our future surveying endeavors. The original egg masses were spotted behind the parking lot adjacent from the garden center, making it a significantly dangerous spot to spotted lanternfly transmission. What we discovered was a significant infestation of spotted lanternfly, as well as a few instances of tree of heaven. Many of the early instar nymphs were scattered among the leaves and vines of the wild grape plants, as well as many individuals being spotted upon the tree of heaven instances growing in the area. We did our best at capturing and eradicating as many as we could within the small jars of alcohol, but the infestation was too large for us to realistically manage. 
We returned to the Lowe's site in mid-July and discovered that the infestation was only getting worse. This was our first viewing of the Red Instar Nymphs, which we found was spreading onto the adjacent rail trail, a walking path that people and bikers from around the county use on a regular basis. This, to us, highlights the immediate necessity for traps in order to bring this infestation under control before it spreads even further. Rock and Lake was the second major site we surveyed, covering a significantly larger area compared to Bear Mountain. The entirety of the lake was encompassed by five different bridge squares, causing us to set up the surveying into several smaller, more focused surveys over the span of several days. We began by inspecting the northern parking lot and the surrounding perimeter, followed by several days of surveying the lake perimeter in one mile increments. Then the remaining areas of interest were examined, including the southern parking lot and the golfing area. Luckily, besides a few instances of Tree of Heaven, no spotted lantern fly was spotted in the park. Our surveying of Rock and Lake proved to us that we are capable of surveying on our own, being able to efficiently and effectively assess larger areas for Tree of Heaven and spotted lantern fly. Marcus and I feel that the most fulfilling aspect of this internship has been the time spent doing educational outreach tabling at the Nyack Farmers Market. We really enjoy engaging with the community in important conversations about local ecology and the importance of nature. People took a lot greater interest in our work than we previously had expected they might. It's a great experience in terms of gauging interactions, practicing public speaking, dipping our toe into the educational field of environmentalism, and it's generally very important work for the project. We've spoken to about 191 people so far. We've also done outreach by taking SLF informational sources to various libraries. Another component of our outreach work with the Cornell Crawford Extension, as well as a component of our final project for Russell Conservation and Service Board, Heather and I partnered with Master Gardener Nancy Quinn in the creation of four spotted lanternfly paper machine models, each depicting a different life state of the insect. These larger than life colorful models act as a hands on display during our tabling outreach to garner attention and interest in the public, especially youth. Here we have images of the completed models, depicting the different stages of spotted lanternfly. Here are the two nymph stages, the black and red. And here we see the adult uh, spotted lanternfly with its wings outstretched. What's great about these models is that they can be utilized by the Cornell Crop Extension for educational outreach for years to come. This internship has already given me a host of skills that are applicable to many of my areas of interest. I've gained a much better appreciation for the importance of local ecology and how small scale ecological communities can be just as impactful as larger ones. I've been pleasantly surprised to find that I really enjoy public outreach, education, and working together with the local community on issues I care about. Furthermore, I have a much deeper technical understanding now of the interplay between flora and fauna in the invasive species work going on. I have previously focused only on animals and have really been opened up to how important plants can be to ecological issues. In participating in this program, I learned how difficult it is to track invasive such as the spotted lantern fly. And in doing educational outreach, I have become more comfortable with engaging and presenting to the public, a skill that is invaluable to an effort such as this one. I was able to see firsthand how many people in the local community are interested in environmental conservation, but do not know much about the local threats. It has shown me truly how important outreach is when it comes to pushing forward the conservation initiatives. It was amazing to interact with so many different people and getting them interested in making a difference through helping stop the spread of fine land and flight. Before working here, I had not realized how prevalent invasive species were in my own community. It opened my eyes to see how easily a species can be transported from one place to another and so rapidly damage the function of an ecosystem. I really gained an appreciation for how difficult it can be to manage invasive species. I think it's important for more people to gain the same awareness I now have about the fragile balance that is in play all around us and how our actions get affected for better or for worse. The beauty of our local ecosystem is a priceless resource to be enjoyed by everyone in the community. Many people utilizing this resource can easily say they support environmental conservation, but few understand how widespread the issue truly is. It is safe to assume that when someone commonly thinks of conserving the environment, 
the first thing that comes to mind would be something such as saving the panda or a static log in the rainforest. Many people tend to overlook the need for local conservation efforts. If populations of the spotted lanternfly are left unchecked, it will have a significant impact on our local ecosystem and economy, a significant impact on the food we eat and the beauty of our natural environment. The first step to any conservation effort is education. If the wider public knows about and understands the gravity of the issue, proper policy can be passed and effective action can be enacted. Part of our work with the CCE is doing just that. It is spreading the word of the seriousness of the spotted land in front of the public and will hopefully serve as a stop to its spread altogether. These efforts are paramount to ensure we preserve the beauty of nature and all its benefits for years to come. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you for your time and have a great day. All right, thanks, Kristen. Uh, <laughs> please pass our thanks along to your interns. Love the models. Uh, next up, we have uh, Westchester Land Trust. Uh, Eric and Brianna, are you guys on? Uh, they'll be on in a sec. Okay. Should we go in uh, to the next presentation and have them go third? Would you like to do that? Uh, yep. They can start right now. Okay. All right. I see Eric and Brianna. I see your, yeah. Hi. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, All right. Yeah, I'm muted. Oh. It is the audio. Do you have two uh, connections? Uh, maybe that's why there's so much feedback. I think we're good now. Thank you. That's it. Good. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Rosa, a summer intern with the Westchester Land Trust. I'm 20 years old, and right now I am studying health and human performance at Westchester Community College. Now, you may be wondering, why is a person majoring in health, interning for a nonprofit that has to do with ecological conservation? I, for one, have a deep love for the conservation field and love working with people like you, like you all, to get many projects done, like making bog bridges, water bars, identifying plants, or even making compost. I love it all, at least the majority of it. <laughs> I have five years of prior conservation experience with another nonprofit called Ground, Groundwork Hudson Valley that specializes in teaching high school level students about the importance of environment, environmentalism, leadership, and sustainability. They took me to many different places to work on, like the Walk Hill River National Wildlife Refuge, community gardens around the Yonkers, Rockefeller State Park, which I met my current boss, John Zeiger. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> They even took me to Yellowstone National Park for a month to work for the Conservation Corps. I don't know about you guys, but the majority of my high school experience before groundwork boiled down to showing up, leaving, and getting help and playing video games. <laughs> like, there wasn't really much going on. <laughs> but now, I feel the ground beneath me and take, in, take into account of my surroundings. I want to cherish the outdoors and experience it and learn more about how to properly take care of our planet which is one of, our, one of the main reasons why I took this internship, and I'm so glad that I did. As you now know, I am currently studying health and human physiology. So I thought to myself, what better project for this internship than to make trails more accessible? Like I'm literally helping people traverse trails and having them experience the outdoors without even being there. How crazy is that? I also added a little side project on making easy to understand difficulty ratings on the trails, which I am still developing as of now. I believe my work is important because it introduces and includes new sets of individuals to our trails that seemingly weren't able to traverse the trail as safely. As most of us can, and of course, as most of us can, and of course, it is, and of course it is a difficult task, but I believe it is important to involve everyone, the opportunity to enjoy the trails we walk. I also believe rating the trails is important because it gives the hikers an idea of what they're working with as they go along. It can give people confidence to try out a trail no, no matter what their goals may be. So far, I have created a handrail Zophnis Preserve, which is located at Pound Ridge for those that are interested in visiting. My fellow intern, Brianna, and a magnificent man by the name of Mike Serde, 
Do you know that one guy that always has the most interesting stories completely unrelated to the project you're working out, you're working on, but somehow manages to make it a lesson? Do you know anyone like that? Well, he is that guy. <laughs> and boy, did he help, he help out on this project. He taught me how to effectively drill and to always think uh, and always try to think bigger when making plans to execute a task. Uh, uh, to try to think about, uh, he, things to have me think about uh, was one, how can we make our lives easier? And two, how to, how to have the structure that we made last for many years to come. After making the handrail, after the handrail was done, sorry, it was a great feeling knowing that someone out there right now could be using the handrail we made to traverse the trail just a little bit safer. But before I even started this project here, I did several things like pulling evasives, like Milo Minute, Bittersweet, Mugwort, and others. I used weed whackers for the first time and maintained trails. I was able to experience how to properly sharpen all, to all sorts of tools by my main man, Mike. <laughs> I also learned from John on how to identify different trees with their leaves and bark like and and bark like for example ash trees the different types of oak trees and a tree I'm sure most if not everyone here has heard of the notorious beech tree <laughs> along with learning about this beautiful smooth tree I was also informed about the beech leaf disease that is slowly killing them the population of this tree is rapidly deteriorating due to the leaf curling and withering that is caused by this disease now, what the Western cilantro had us do about it was head to the Dolphins Preserve, uh, map patches of the beech trees that had the majority of their canopy removed, and be ready to, and so we can be ready to replace those trees in the future, if or when they die, before we find a solution to this disease. I have learned a lot so far about the nonprofit world as well, uh, working with most branches and seeing how orderly everything is. Really, it's really tough to keep one one together, if you ask me. The West Chester Land Trust and all other nonprofits have my respect. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to my last few weeks here, and I can't wait to see more. I, I can't wait to see what more I can learn from you. Thank you. Great job, thank you. Um, are we going to hear from your colleague? Yeah, Brianna's going to be on right now. Okay. I'm short, so I'm going to move this down. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, my name is Brianna Marcano, and I'm the second um, intern at the Westchester Land Trust. Um, I personally have three years of experience working with Groundwork Hudson Valley, the same nonprofit as Eric, um, down in Yonkers. Um, yeah, so so far this summer, I've uh, utilized my time with the Westchester Land Trust to develop a pretty brief curriculum uh, for middle school age students on the implementation of natural gardens um, and how they're a better, better alternative for the environment as opposed to the average well manicured garden. Um, while my aim was to foster an interest in conservation within like these kids, um, the tangible goal of this project was actually to establish a natural garden um, at the Westchester Land Trust headquarters, Sugar Hill Farm in Bedford Hills. Um, and sharing this knowledge, especially among youth groups, is so important because natural gardens provide a significant habitat for native animals, especially pollinators, such as bees and butterflies. Um, and depending on the types of plants in these gardens, they can also serve to feed families, even if it's only on a relatively small scale. Um, so plans were made for me to actually implement this lesson plan um, in working with the Greenberg Youth Police Camp on uh, July 20, 20th. Um, but this is unfortunately canceled due to the COVID situation. So um, to pivot, um, myself with the help of others will eventually develop the garden um, here anyway. Um, however, I do plan to test out my curriculum on a different youth group later on. Um, so as part of my internship, I've completed an array of workshops and tasks across all the departments at the Westchester Land Trust. Uh, we've done plenty of invasive plant species removal and identification, including mile a minute, Japanese barberry, um, and oriental bittersweet, to name a few. Um, Japanese barberry has been especially highlighted as we have done a couple of sessions of flame weaning at the Hunter Brook Preserve um, to scale back the spread of the plant. Um, flame weaning is a self-explanatory process um, in which a large controlled flame is used to burn shrubs and 
at their base in order to kill the plant completely and stop regrowth. Um, another highlight is our work with the iNaturalist app. As someone who is not familiar with many native plants, um, iNaturalist has become a pretty invaluable tool for me. Um, I've definitely made it a habit to post any unfamiliar species of plants or animals in an effort to approve, improve my um, admittedly subpar identification skills. Um, my uh, goals for the rest of the summer are to continue traveling down the many avenues of conservation as I have access to here, to here in Bedford Hills. Um, I've been introduced to several different roles that can exist within a nonprofit and how they're all essential to the mission of the organization through the nature of their work. Um, and though these roles differ in significant ways between leadership, fundraising, land management, and beyond, um, conservation nonprofits can have a place for someone of pretty much any skill set is what I've learned. Um, in my last few weeks at the Westchester Land Trust, I would like to focus my efforts on more preserved maintenance work, preserved maintenance work or construction, because um, as someone who wants to pursue a less physically active and more academic career, I would love to take the time to do more stuff that I won't have time to, in, to do in later years. So very happy with my time spent here. And um, I think that's pretty much all I have. Nice. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, I put a question in the chat. It looks like John answered it. Thank you, Brianna and Eric. Sounds like you had a really, both of you had a really interesting internship so far. I uh, hope you, the rest of your season is uh, just as good. Um, got a, 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 some kudos in the chat. Um, next up, we have uh, Bronx is Blooming. Uh, Maisie, do you wanna share your screen? All right, hi everyone. Hi, Maisie. All right, great. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we will be presenting on surveying for spotted lanternfly invasive species awareness in the Bronx. And we are the Bronx is Blooming. I'm Maisie Baronian. I'm the environmental assistant for the project. And I'm Tamor, I'm a place mentor this summer. So the Bronx is Blooming is an environmental nonprofit that focuses on environmental stewardship, community building, and youth leadership development in parks across the South Bronx. Um, the parks that we work in are severely underfunded and under-resourced compared to the other parks in New York City, such as Central Park and Prospect Park that have private money um, funneled in through conservancies. Um, so we help to bring in a little extra environmental love and care through um, tree stewardship, mulching, planting native gardens, and invasive species removal. We also do community building through our um, volunteer events where we get community volunteers through partnerships like New York Cares. And then Tamora is going to talk a little bit about our youth leadership development program as well. So a uh, PLACE program is a six-week summer program that employs high school students do SOIP or a summer youth employment program. The goal of this program is to inform and educate employed high school students about the many problems facing our Bronx's parks and how we can help to encourage the community to be involved in creating environmental change. So these mentors that you see right here, um, they each receive a team of students and are placed in different parks throughout the Bronx. And Tamar here is in charge of Soundview Park, which is the park that this project has been focusing on. It is along in the Southeast Bronx, along the Bronx River. And one of its uh, highlights is being on the Bronx River Greenway, um, which is like a, a path along the Bronx River that's very forested, as you can see, and it's got a bike trail and a trail that people can walk along. And so our project is also focusing on the spotted lanternfly which I know now we've heard a bit about, um, but just to reiterate, so the spotted lanternfly is an invasive species from East Asia that um, has become a real issue within the agricultural field, um, specifically because these insects have what's called piercing sucking mouth parts. So when they feed off a plant, they um, will excrete what's called honeydew, which is like a sugary waste on the outside of the plant and then the honeydew will promote the growth of the black sooty molds, which you can see on an image on the left, um, which then 
renders the plant damaged. And if it's an agricultural plant, such as apples or grapes, um, it's inedible. So that has a lot of impacts on the economy and agriculture and on people's livelihoods. So we have been um, spreading awareness about spotted lanternfly. And um, additionally, in Soundview Park, there's uh, many Tree of Heaven stands and the Tree of Heaven is the host species for the spotted lanternfly. So it's thought to probably be essential for their life cycle. So we have been, um, one of our projects has been finding the different stands of the Tree of Heaven throughout Soundview Park and clearing the invasive species that surround them. So as you can see in these images, they're kind of surrounded in species such as mugwort and garlic mustard. And so to introduce our summer mentors to this project, we had them clear a stand so that they're able to be monitored for the spotted lantern fly. And we're continuing this project with our um, summer youth employment team, that's uh, Tamora's team, um, that is in this park. So they've been kind of clearing a trail so that we're really able to monitor them for a spotted lantern fly. Another project that we've been doing within Soundview Park is um, also focusing more on saving the native species that are there. So since this park is really overrun with invasives, one of our main projects with, as you can see, our community group of volunteers here, we um, cleared a stand of service berry trees that have a lot of benefits to wildlife, provide food for many local birds, and we cleared them of many invasive species. And we're also doing the same with um, a stand of smooth sumac, um, which also provide a lot of benefits to pollinators and wildlife. And tomorrow we'll tell you a little bit about what that process is like. So um, as you can see on these two pictures, there are a lot of weeds surrounding the sumac trees that are uh, very invasive. So those include um, mugwort, Asiatic bittersweet, uh, honeysuckle, and uh, the white mulberry tree. And a reason why they're invasive is because they are harmful to the ecosystem in that area of the sumac tree. And they will deprive the sumac tree of um, much needed nutrients and resources. And also uh, a particular weed called Asiatic bittersweet is especially harmful to the sumac tree because it will coil and wrap around the, uh, the stems of the tree and choke the tree. And it will also shade out the, uh, the sun so that the, the tree won't grow to its um, maximum height. And um, some of the ways we uh, deal with these is by hand weeding the weeds. Uh, we could use pruners and loppers and also hand saws, so depending on the type of weed. And for the affected and unaffected sumac trees, um, on both pictures of the same plant, you can kind of see like there's a clear difference on the left, there's many weeds around it. And um, specifically the uh, Asiatic bittersweet, it, uh, it can like uh, grow high up and block the sun. So uh, it's very low to the ground. And on, on the right, you can see there's not, not many weeds around the uh, sumac tree so it can grow to its fullest height. And uh, the two individuals in this picture are uh, David and John Tay, and they assisted me in removing these invasive species surrounding the sumac tree. And here is a picture of a community volunteer and he through New York Cares, and he assisted me and my team to uh, remove some invasive species on that uh, specific day. And, yeah. and he had a great time, right? I had a great time, <laughs> I had a great time, yeah. <laughs> Um, so another big focus on this project is just doing a lot of outreach and education on the spotted lanternfly. So um, actually the student that you see on my left is a um, one of our play students from a different park, actually in Cortona Park, another park in the Bronx. And um, he uh, goes to school in Pennsylvania and is very familiar with the spotted lanternfly. So has... Um, been spending a lot of time helping me with the outreach and education that we've been doing. So we've been giving out a lot of the uh, promotional materials that Linda kind of showed us in the beginning and um, showing people, explaining to people about spotted lantern fly, um, where it comes from, how to prevent it, doing things like 
if you travel to Pennsylvania or New Jersey, make sure to check your car tires. If you're going camping, make sure to check your gear. And then like the little cards with images of uh, what to do if you see one, who to report it to, um, scraping off the egg masses and so on and so forth. Yep. And uh, for future projects in Soundview, uh, there continues to be many locations around the park that are affected, uh, like the sumac tree that need uh, care and attention. And me and my team will uh, go around to find different projects around the park. And it's shown throughout the pictures that are like have lots of weeds around them. So those are projects that we can do in the future. Additionally, we plan on hopefully next week um, bringing all of the students from the different parks, all our summer youth employment students to Soundview Park and um, monitoring all of the Tree of Heavens for a spotted lanternfly and using um, IMAP invasives. So that is a project we are excited for. Additionally, as you can see on the bottom, there's this area in the entryway towards the park that is overgrown with invasive species. So we would like to clear that area and um, plant a native garden bed that will help um, just promote uh, pollinators and other local species. So yes, that is our presentation. Um, thank you all so much. And thank you guys. This is a great job on the sumacs and the service berries. This, uh, I'm sure they will be breathing a sigh of relief. <laughs> well done. Okay, up next, um, Brent. Uh, that's good. Uh, uh, Westchester Parks Foundation interns couldn't be with us today, so they sent a video. Uh, so Brent's going to play it for us. All righty. Hi, guys. Uh, let's see if this works. I, I downloaded it to QuickTime, so hopefully um, you guys can hear it, see it a little bit better than when we did the practice run. Hold on. Hold on a second, sorry about this. Ah. Sorry guys. I can't find the play button, oh here it is. Hi, my name is Scott Kleinberg. I'm a graduate student at Pace University. I'm studying environmental science and environmental policy. I'm doing an internship this summer at the Westchester Parks Foundation to learn more about community projects dealing with environmental problems, such as removing invasive plants, uh, clearing weeds, planting trees, removing trash, and um, anything else that needs to be done to keep the parks clean, safe, and healthy for everyone. The Westchester Parks Foundation is a nonprofit organization that supports all 50 Westchester County Public Parks. We engage the public to advocate for and invest in the preservation, conservation, use, and enjoyment of the 18,000 acres of parks, trails, and open spaces within the Westchester County Park System. The Westchester Parks Foundation creates and manages programs that unite the people from all corners of our county together, where they're inspired to care for, learn about, and enjoy our parks. This is the plant that we've been removing at the park. Today is our fifth day working on the park. Uh, at the start of this day, we've had 13,000 pounds of plant matter removed. We've been working with 19 green terms. Those are our junior high, high school, and college students who are learning about this program. We've had 21 community members so far helping out with the project as well. Here uh, at Blue Mountain Reservation, we're working to remove the European water chestnut invasive species, um, uh, devastating the uh, Lower Hudson River area. Uh, lots of bodies of water are infected with this plant. Um, we're with the green terns. We are showing them why this invasive species is an issue, um, how to remove it, and the importance of um, dealing with invasive species to help the local ecosystem. They're also here to learn how to engage with community members. We have a lot of local community members here today uh, helping out. 
and we also have uh, Prison themselves, a, a great organization here as well, helping out. And uh, the Green Turns will learn leadership skills. They will learn the importance of the environment. They will learn um, what environmental careers are out there for them. And they will learn teamwork skills as well. This Green Turnship program, removing the water chestnut here at Blue Mountain, uh, is a two-week program, after which we will be doing a second program at Kibitz Brook Park, where we'll be removing more invasive plants. We have some students that are the same, some new students, and we'll continue to engage the community and show them the importance of removing the water chestnut from parks around the county. By removing the plant, we can create a space where people will be safe to swim again, hopefully, where they can fish, and where people can boat freely across the lake without having to be tangled up in the plants. Working on this project has given me leader skills, helping me learn more about communities, organizing events, and meeting uh, people of all ages. By completing this project, I hope to see a pond where native flora and fauna can flourish and where a clean space of water can be used by wildlife to promote uh, natural environmental functions and where people themselves can come and visit and enjoy nature. I've been a lifelong lover of animals, wildlife, and nature. That helped me gain interest in um, biology, which is my undergraduate degree. Gaining understanding of animals, the ecosystem, the environment, and why it's important to conserve and preserve wildlife um, has gotten me to this point today. Uh, after doing work uh, advocating for the environment, I shifted now toward a degree where I can learn and find ways to take my knowledge of science and improve uh, environmental policy in the United States. When this internship ends for me, I'm going to return uh, and finish my final year in graduate school. I plan to use my degree to promote wildlife conservation, to uh, teach the public about the environment, and to hopefully create a better world where people uh, take care of the environment, protect nature, and uh, have an awareness of invasive species and understand the importance of keeping uh, foreign wildlife out of our ecosystem and out of our environment. I'm happy that you at Prism are taking the time to watch me and hear about my experience. We're also happy to have Prism here again helping us today and I hope to learn a lot from you guys and hope uh, to work with you more in the future. Thank you. All right, that was the Westchester County Park or Westchester Parks Foundation video. We're going to bump up the Wallkill Valley Land Trust. Um, that's also a video, and uh, we might as well just take care of that right now while Brent has the floor and he can play that one. Um, the Vassar uh, Hudson Highland Lands Trust uh, Fresh Air Fund, Lewis Calder, folks, you guys will be right after this uh, next video. All right, thanks guys, here we go. Let me know if I gotta turn up or down the volume. It sounds okay, let's see. Hi, my name is Marguerite. And I'm here at the Wallkill Valley Land Trust. This summer, I am working on a project that focuses on invasive species management. So a large part of the Land Trust mission is to protect natural spaces in Ulster County. And a big part of that includes um, managing invasive species on their properties in order to um, help protect the health of ecosystems, um, promote biodiversity and protect native species in the area. And so some of the goals for my project are to record the presence of invasive species by going out and doing field work. And I am focusing on three properties in particular that the Land Trust owns. Um, and then I wanna use these observations to do research and collect resources that will help me figure out the best strategies for managing these invasives, whether that's preventing um, further spread or trying to remove them entirely. So the three properties that I'm focusing on are, um, are important because two of them are already open for the public. And the third one has future plans to become a pocket park 
um, for the public. So there are plans to create trails in this property. Um, two of them are located in Rosendale, and the third one is in New Paltz, which is the Nyquist Harcourt Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, so I have been going out to these three properties and I've been using IMAP Invasives, which is an app and website that helps you um, record your observations and upload them onto a map to um, kind of get a better sense of where these invasives are located within these three properties. So as I continue working on this project, I'm going to be going back to these properties and collecting more data. Um, so I take pictures of the invasives and I upload them into IMAP invasives. And then I am going to transfer this data into ArcGIS um, to create three different maps um, for each of the properties. Um, and then using these maps, I can identify the uh, high priority areas um, that we really want to focus on versus areas that might not need so much attention. Um, and then I'm going to gather resources um, that kind of contain good management strategies for specific invasive um, either plants or diseases or um, insects that are impacting the plants and ecosystem in these um, in these lands. Um, and ultimately, I want to kind of expand on this research to create a comprehensive guide that can be used as a template for any other properties that the land trust wants to work on in the future to um, manage invasive species. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a brief overview of what I have been working on and what I want to continue to work on. And um, just for a little background on myself, I recently graduated from SUNY New Paltz with a bachelor's in geography. And this is my first time working with invasives. So, um, so far I've learned a lot about just kind of how to identify invasives. And I'm really excited to continue learning throughout this process. And um, I hope that the final product um, can be helpful for, um, you know, continuing invasive species work in the area. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Thanks for playing those, Brent. Kara, please uh, pass along our uh, thanks to, um, to your intern, Marguerite. And uh, it sounds like she has a great project there. Um, next up are the um, Vassar Hudson Highlands Land Trust, uh, Fresh Air Fund, Lewis Calder Foundation, interns. If you guys want to go ahead and share your screen, um, who is here? Someone unmute yourself and identify. Uh, I think we're going to have Echo and Bronwyn do the screen sharing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have no idea if our camera's working, so. Uh... Sorry about that, but hopefully the screen share is fine. Um, all right. Can everyone see that? I can see it, yes. Okay, lovely. Orange. I'm gonna minimize that. And cool. Okay. Okay. Um, so we are five of the interns uh, working this summer. Um, I'm Rue, I'm stationed at the Lewis Calder Center. Um, we also have Katie and Adriana at Sharp Reservation and Granite Mountain. Um, and then we have Echo and Bronwyn who are stationed at the Vassar Ecological Preserve. So we're each gonna kind of talk about the work we're doing this summer, um, some of our goals that we're hoping to get done by the end of the summer and sort of give you a brief introduction of who we are and what we're doing. 
Uh, so again, I'm Rue. I'm at the Lewis Calder Center. I'm the Emma intern. Um, and if you want to flip to the next slide, I will get started. Uh, so we all have a lot of different projects happening, but we tried to kind of uh, consolidate to the main stuff that we've been focusing on um, to keep our time frame down. I know we don't have a ton of time, but so um, this summer, my main first project has been sort of trying to ease integration of like new interns, um, outreach, things like that, um, and improve our ability to educate interns and um whoever may come across our uh, our websites and YouTube videos and things like that. So um, we started this summer by kind of putting together collections of training materials, building up lots of background on what species are pertinent, um, mostly focusing on tier twos, but also a bit on tier five species, uh, and just putting together everything that we can that can train people on how to carry out species IDs in the field, um, how to uh, figure out which species are actually threats, how to manage things in their own yard that might become a threat to the environment around them, um, things like that. So just kind of give people solid background. Um, and then we're also currently uh, trying to build some species ID guidebooks. Um, these could be PDFs or we also have a printout. Um, and this would just like help train me and also future interns like myself uh, on how to identify the species that we're working with when they're out in the field. It's kind of a nice um, tactile thing to hold in your hands and uh, flip through and start memorizing and being able to identify these things more readily. Um, and we've also been taking cuttings from different sites uh, that are a part of the Emma network um, and pressing those to include in the guidebooks. So just trying to create like fun, engaging ways to increase our ability to disseminate information. Um, and then kind of our next step, uh, which I'm hoping to get done before the end of the summer, is we'd also like to start updating the PRISM website um, to include more thorough descriptions and info pages for each of the species that are listed under tiers one through five. Um, so the PRISM website has been trying to update each individual species page uh, to include more information. And since I'm a handy intern, <laughs> um, it's one of our goals to uh, sort of devote some time to um, making those pages a little bit more comprehensive. Um, so really anything that can make all of our information clearer to the public, um, help train people, help inform people and spread the word basically. Um, so project two this summer, if you want to flip slides. Uh, our other focus is establishing really solid communication, collecting data, and creating consistent methodology for establishing phenology trails. So we're trying to open up lines of communication between the different sites across the Hudson River Valley and um, start to integrate things into a more like consistent system for collecting data. So the first step to this was sending out surveys to all of the Emma sites to determine prevalence of emerging invasive plants. Um, so we basically just surveyed everybody that we could on tier two and tier five species that were present um, or not present at their sites. And we were basically trying to determine which species represented the biggest threats, where we might find them, uh, and from there, then start determining what we could do to control them. Um, we've also been visiting sites to try and, you know, further establish that communication and to take a look at some of the existing phenology trails um, so that we can understand how current phenology trails are being set up, what kind of data they're collecting, what their focus is, whether they're public or private, things like that. Um, and from there, we're hoping to establish a phenology trail at the Calder Center where I'm stationed um, and sort of come up with a set of guidelines to make things consistent across different sites. So if another Emma site is establishing their own new phenology trail, how can they do that in a way that um, sort of follows a similar methodology to the one that we're establishing? And how can we ensure that all of the data that we're all collecting is consistent and thorough? 
um, and can be communicated between sites. So those are my main two projects currently. Um, and I will hand it over to Adriana and Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Adriana. And I'm Katie. Um, we're the interns at the Fresh Air Fund and Hudson Islands Land Trust. Um, we spend half our time here at Sharp Reservation, which is in Fishkill. Um, and then we spend our other half at the Hudson Highlands Land Trust um, Granite Mountain Preserve in Putnam Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Echo. You're the best. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our projects that we've done this summer include like invasive plant species removal, such as like yellow archangel and black swallowwort. Um, we go and we map out where certain species are, so we can try to figure out like the extent of where they are on the properties. Um, and we use a lot of GIS software to do that. Um, we do some plot surveys, such as like lingering ash. Um, and we recently did a beech leaf disease survey. And we've been working on some education and outreach materials, along with like the other conglomerate of this group with like Echo and Bronwyn and Brew. And we made like some videos together that we're gonna publish by the end of the summer. Um, and like Katie and I made a pamphlet for our like maintenance people teaching them like what invasive species are common here at Sharp um, so that they can hopefully help us get rid of some of them. Yeah, and those are some pictures of stuff that we found since our internship that we thought were fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just to speak on a few of our specific projects, um, particularly our plot projects, um, this is our lingering ash plot project at Sharp Reservation, and we created a nice GIS map to show the results. So um, basically a lingering ash plot is, or we started with a lingering ash plot of around 40 trees. Um, uh, lingering ash meaning an ash tree that may be able to resist the emerald ash borer, which is a common invasive um, that has been kind of decimating the ash tree populations. Um, so this we just um, concluded our third year of this um, survey um, through MAMA, which is monitoring and managing ash. It's a um, and uh, it's a group that um, helps conduct these um, kinds of ash plot surveys and um, in our third year, we are left with 17 live ash trees. And you can see on this map that um, this shows the extent of our ash population in this plot, as well as the kind of um, health score of each, um, just to show which trees are doing well, which trees aren't doing so well. Um, and on the right, you can see a picture of an ash tree that shows many signs of infection by emerald ash borer. So first of all, it has some flaking of the bark, and that is a really cool looking and complicated like serpentine like um, structure in the tree that's caused by the um, emerald ash borer itself. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about our ash project. And then another project we've been doing is our beech leaf disease survey at Granite Mountain Preserve in Putnam Valley. So um, I believe last year or this year, um, beech leaf disease was discovered at Granite Mountain Preserve for the first time. And which, June. yeah, so this right year. Before our internship started, um, yeah. Nicole found beech leaf disease at Granite Mountain Preserve. Yeah, so you can see in the right, um, there's a photo of kind of the lower canopy of an ash tree and um, beech leaf disease is characterized by um, dark striping on the leaves. Yeah, and there's the mouse kind of surrounding that one leaf that you can see is infected. So um, beech leaf disease is an emerging invasive species. So we're concerned about, you know, how it could be spreading. And we know that it causes tree death among ash or among beech trees um, within just a few years of infection. And this map we created shows the extent of beech leaf disease at Granite Mountain Preserve in the areas where we did find beech. So we surveyed um, the entire trail system and you can see our results um, showing some areas were more heavily infected than others. And hopefully our research going forward can be used to kind of figure out more of how beech leaf disease is spread um, and what the effects are. And actually, um, this research is um, going to be used by CUNY researchers to see how um, different methods of aerial surveying um, and remote, yeah, remote <laughs> sensing can be used to kind of monitor beech leaf disease. We're also making a video on this. So I know beech leaf disease is the EcoQuest topic for July. So 
hopefully our video will come out soon. If, if that's <laughs> helpful to y'all, feel free to like shoot us an email. We will happily assist. Yeah. All right, I think we're unmuted now. Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, we're the um, intern stationed at the Vassar Farm and Ecological Preserve. Um, I'm Echo. I use any and all pronouns. I graduated Vassar College with um, a degree in environmental studies. And my name is Bronwyn. I use they all pronouns. And I also graduated from Vassar this past June with a degree in environmental studies. Um, so we're just going to walk you through a couple of things that we've been working on here at the Vassar Ecological Preserve. Um, so we are one of the locations for a visit from the PRISM Strike Force. Um, so the like main part of our job has been surveying for emerging invasive species and creating a map. So some of the things that are a particular concern um, on campus and on the preserve are the Castor aurelia tree, sapphire berry, chocolate vine, and hardy kiwi. Um, we are a <laughs> hotspot for emerging invasives because we have an arboretum on campus, which means we have a lot of introduced species. Um, some of these, for example, like the Castor aurelia tree, we have the potential of being like the sole seed source for the Hudson Valley. Um, so this is like, uh, really kind of important and very fulfilling work to be working on this. Um, yeah. So on the left, we just have uh, the map that we have spent the last several weeks building as we survey the grid um, and the trails. Yep, so um, another major project we've been working on is the management of common invasive species um, on the ecological preserve. Um, so every single week um, we monitor for the spotted lanternfly on a lot of the um, trees of heaven that we have um, pretty close to the entrance of the preserve. Um, we also have like, um, I forget how many acres of old fields we have, but um, 40 something. Yeah, we've got like 40 something acres of old fields um, and a lot of them have like pretty large patches of mugwort. So we've been um, mapping that, um, getting uh, a map of the mugwort populations to um, Vassar grounds crew so that they can come mow it. Um, we've also been removing black swallow wart and jet bead. Um, and then we also have some pretty big knotweed populations that we need to cut. Um, we already cut them once, but we still have to cut them again because it just keeps coming back. Um, and we also missed a couple the first time. Um, and we're also just kind of trying to keep uh, the knotweed contained um, where it is right now, because um, it's just kind of hard to reduce um, reduce the number of individuals. Um, we also have a rare plant area, um, really just like the nodding trilliums, and we've been uh, cutting back porcelain berry around the nodding trillium so that they can survive. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like the last part of what we do on Vassar's Ecological Preserve is an education and outreach. Um, so this has taken a lot of different forms. Um, we, ha we did early on in our internship, we did a presentation on invasive plant management and ID to the town of Poughkeepsie. Um, and also we are in the process of arranging a training for Vassar's grounds crew to ID and manage common invasive plants that they will probably run into at work. Yeah, and um, in line with like the rest of the interns um, for this internship, we also uh, made an outreach video that will be published soon on just like the relationship between conservation and colonialism. So shoot us an email if you're interested in it. Um, and we also um, are including a link in that to our zine for uses of invasive plants. Um, so stuff like um, just common uses from the um, like areas that they are originally from. Yeah, I think that concludes our presentation. So thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys doing some really wonderful things. Um, definitely let us know when your videos are ready, uh, if you post them on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you post them so we can share them, uh, YouTube, uh, whatever the, the media is. We definitely like to help promote those. Um, 
All right, so next up we have Lily from New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. Uh, Lily, do you have a screen to share? Yes, hi, how are you? Hi, I can see you. Okay. Okay. Does everybody see? Yes, that? you're good. Okay, I'm just gonna hide myself. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lily Gelfars, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Trail Outreach and Education Stewards in the Hudson Valley. Uh, so these are the invasive species projects that we have been working on this season. Okay, so just to give a little background on what our job is, because it's a little different um, than some of the other teams, I believe. So we're the Trail Stewards is the name that we kind of go by. We are a group of 11 in the Hudson Valley. Uh, we have four returning members from the previous season and seven of us are new members. Ours does not have an upper age limit. So we have a 20 year old who was a freshman in college and we have a very wise elder person, that's me. Uh, who is like post masters, uh, just checking out this sector of the world. Uh, it's very fun to work with people who think I'm elderly. Uh, they ask if I plan my funeral when I go home, which I do not yet. Uh, so what we do all day is really providing face-to-face -face user education and on the ground solutions at popular hiking destinations. Uh, so we are the people that you see, usually we are stationed under that tent in the image right here, or in on the trail at different sort of more dangerous junctions. I'll show you afterwards where we're located. Uh, and through education and interactions, the idea is to collect, protect the ecological integrity of these places that are being threatened by issues such as misuse and high usage. Um, and sort of going forward, encouraging public participation and multiplying these solutions exponentially. So I at the trailhead tell a person who tells multiple people and hopefully um, expand the knowledge. So. With regards to invasives, we sort of have this two-pronged approach, which I've called education and eradication. Uh, so one part of it is the stewardship and user awareness at Breakneck Ridge, Bear Mountain, and Croton. And then the other is the actual eradication of invasive species. So we did work on a garlic mustard removal project at the old Croton Aqueduct Trail and the Croton Gorge Unique area. So firstly, uh, just invasives education. So because we have a pretty wide ranging group of people, some of whom knew a lot about plants and some of like myself who knew absolutely nothing, we had to learn what invasives were first. Um, so when they asked me to do this presentation, I was like, we, I don't know, like we know nothing about invasives. All we did was pull garlic mustard, but going over the season, we did actually, you know, you know more than you know, you know. Uh, so we had to learn, we did this play clean go training, which is simple things like boot brushes and you know, removing the seeds from the boots at the end of the hike. Um, we had leave no trace training, the two day uh, leave no trace education course, um, focusing for the invasives would be the principal four of leave what you find. We watched a talk with uh, Doug, by Doug Tallamy, um, are alien plants bad and, bad and had a nice discussion about that. We've done invasive training with Diane Alden in Croton, who I believe I did see uh, her name in this presentation. And we use SEEK during trail maintenance. So this was all just like us building our education to even learn what invasives are in order to then go ahead and share them with the public. Um, so then when we're stationed at the trailheads, if we do encounter users who seem like they would like a little more information than just what route to take on a particular day, we can engage with them about the different species that they might encounter on the trail. And in a way, I feel like we act as ambassadors and translators between just the regular person going out for a hike and the knowledgeable technical professionals, which would be most of the people in this discussion. So I actually found on the one hand, you know, I would say we feel a little insecure about like, oh, I don't have, you know, all the Latin names and all of the very specifics. However, I almost think that being the sort of intermediary with some knowledge, but not overly jargon amount of knowledge enables us to better connect with the people that are hiking and then make them feel less intimidated about going further in their education. So there's some people, you know, out on the trail. Uh, so just where we're located, we're at Bear Mountain, uh, Bear Mountain State Park in Orange and Rockland counties. We are situated at the Appalachian Trailhead. There's also the Major Welsh Trail and the Suffern Bear Mountain Trail. So we see 
an average Saturday, there's about 1,300 people starting a hike. Figure we engage with about 400 of them. There's usually three people stationed there. So we are really talking to many people. This is not to say we have a full analysis of what a Wineberry does to the ecosystem with each individual user. However, we are able to reach many people. Uh, we're also at Breakneck Ridge in the Hudson Highlands State Park Reserve. That's Putnam and Dutchess counties. As you can see, if anyone's been there, you've maybe had the somewhat unpleasant experience of waiting online on a rock face. Um, and again, another very high use area. I'd say an average Saturday there is more like six to 800 people, which is less, but still, you know, a high number. Uh, and then we're also at the Old Croton Aqueduct and Croton Gorge Unique area in Westchester County in New York. Um, so the Old Croton Aqueduct is the trail that goes from the Croton Dam all the way down to Van Cortland Park. Um, and then, you know, continues into the city at Bryant Park near the library. And then, so that's one aspect of it, but we're also uh, stewarding the Gort Croton Gorge Unique area, which is this pictured right here. It's a beautiful, um, very sort of interesting location that is small and did see high usership in the last couple of years. And so the idea of us being there is to educate people as they come to help it from getting damaged, which it was damaged in the past. Um, another thing, as many people have talked about, we are aware of the beech leaf disease. We found it on the Long Pass in Belt, New York, um, when we were doing trail maintenance. So it, this is just sort of when we're out and about, we're always, now that we sort of know what to look for, are looking for these things, the reporting, uh, wine berries, and the more that we, you know, that's a fun part of this, obviously. Um, and then the play clean go. So we have a fun video, let's see if it plays, of the boot rush. Don't need to say that again. So I was very excited to make that video. But so something like that, uh, just an example of we have that stationed under the tent and we explain to people, you know, when you're done with your hike, you can do what I just did in this video in the very dramatic fashion to get the seeds and you don't transport them to your own location. And then we can sort of explain why invasives are bad for the uh, ecosystem. All right. Another thing that's not technically an invasive species, uh, but we do deal with a lot is the trash. And I think if you want to sort of extend the metaphor, it is obviously does not belong in the environment or the ecosystem, um, does damage plant and animal life and negatively impacts everything. So, you know, we have the little scales we spend, you know, when we have some downtime, we will go around um, and collect the trash. And I sort of like this sort of analogy of the trash being an invasive species. Um, I was going to say something else. I will continue. Uh, so the second, I guess, prong to this is the Croton Gorge Unique Area Garlic Mustard Eradication Project. That was what we were working on earlier in the season. Uh, so under the mentorship and leadership of Croton on Hudson advocate community member and outdoor woman, outdoors woman Diane Alden, we worked to remove garlic mustard as well as additional invasive species from the Croton Gorge uh, Unique Area. So this was just a picture of the different uh, species I pulled on one random Saturday. We had garlic mustard, wild chervil, and cardamine impatiens. Uh, after hearing somebody in one video say they pulled 13,000 pounds, my 76 pound slot of garlic mustard seems a bit paltry. Um, however, we do what we can. And I think the challenge that we face is that, and challenge and benefit is that we're on the trail stewarding. So you know, we're trying to do the invasive removal, but often people come up and talk to us. So it's a good opportunity to explain to them what we're doing and why we're doing it. However, in terms of like quantity pulled, it's often not as high as if we were just sort of ignoring the recreationists and just like yanking it out of the, out of the ground. Uh, but yeah, this was like one hour, I think 76 pounds, they said. So we've, we've managed to, to get some of it out. Um, yeah, so here's just another couple of pictures. This is another bag of garlic mustard. This is Rosa who has one stalk in her hand. Um, and this is a video of sort of the area we were focusing on. As you can see, it's just the aqueduct trail is 
uh, to the left of this video and you just have the whole entire hill is covered with the garlic mustard. On the one hand, it did seem like an impossible project. And I will say that walking, hiking in other areas of the aqueduct in Tarrytown and Dobbs Ferry, it's almost like unenjoyable to hike at this point because all I do is see these invasive species, but I guess, you know, it's good to know. Sorry. All right, so that was uh, one day a wild chervil removal. So it doesn't quite show up, but before and after 27 pounds, I guess it's a testament to how much there is that 27 pounds doesn't even really quite look like um, it's gone. But I assure you, I was sweating and pulling. So then why are these projects important? Um, from our point of view as stewards, it allows us to raise awareness and expand the public knowledge of invasive species in order to broaden this network of individuals who care about the ecosystem and therefore increase likelihood of preservation. So other uh, presenters have mentioned, you know, policies and actual, you know, governmental changes, but also individually, you know, the boot brush and just being aware of the surrounding, you know, flora and fauna and just, the history of each location. And I think that that definitely enriches somebody's uh, visit to a location and will hopefully make them care about it a bit more as opposed to just a backdrop on a cool picture. Um, obviously the removal of the actual removal benefits the native species, both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, and then the mental health and socio-emotional benefits. So I think that if we encourage people to, right, to go outside more, and to recognize these plants and to know not just, oh, this is a weed, but this is garlic mustard and it came from here and this is what it does to the landscape and this is the repercussions it can have. Um, I found this cool quote even on this article that was published yesterday by Spencer Scott, climate activist. So talking about like why it's important to know about the each individual plant names, right? Changes your relationship to the world. It populates your perception with long lost relatives. It helps situate you in the real world instead of a featureless fantasy. It may even ease your spiritual loneliness. So I think our team is very, we enjoy sort of conversing about, we're less data driven and a bit more qualitative, I would say. And so we do end up getting into these sort of philosophical questions about, you know, what is the purpose of all this? And I think that you know, the invasives have sort of shown us, yes, we're helping the ecosystem, but just giving people the tools to be more comfortable in the outdoors, especially at the locations we're at, which see these high numbers of users, many of whom are not as familiar with the outdoors as we may be. Um, it sort of empowers them to feel comfortable there and feel like they belong. Um, so what's next for some of our core members? I asked some of my colleagues to write a sentence and they gave me many sentences, so I don't want to go too long. Uh, this is Jen. She did this last year as well, so this is her second year. Her sort of focus will be environmental education. Uh, she studied ecosystems and human impact at SUNY Stony Brook, uh, wants to find a job in environmental education to teach people and children about plants, animals, ecosystems, the environment, and sustainability. Uh, she said she had a limited background in invasives, uh, but now that she knows about the serious impacts they have on the environment. She would love to teach future generations about invasives. Uh, so that's Jen, loving on the rock. Uh, then we have Rose. So she's interested uh, post-AmeriCorps in scientific field work in connection to the climate crisis. That's her with a kind of crazy amount of garlic mustard. Uh, so she said that after this term, she'd like to start an academic track to do scientific field work. Uh, really enjoyed learning about invasives. And then she said her view of her own role within the climate crisis we face is helping my community. Part of that is getting rid of dangerous invasive species and bringing in and educating people on native plants and animals and insects. So these two women were more um, staying in the conservation uh, world. Then I had myself, just because I figured I should mention myself since I'm the one giving the presentation. Uh, I'm a student at the CUNY Grad Center doing a social and environmental justice studies concentration in their uh, liberal arts program, aiming to uh, do an environmental psychology PhD starting next fall. Um, I mean, I have a lot of different interests. Recent, I've through hiked the Appalachian Trail, uh, the Vermont Long Trail, the Camino de Santiago in Spain, and the Arizona Trail. So I'm very interested in like long distance hiking, but also the greater implications on society, like people think it's this individual act, but what does it really mean in the greater good? And is it even a good thing to be doing? So sort of exploring the idea of humans 
uh, specifically white people from imperialist nations, uh, being invasive species in nature and the outdoors uh, in the conservation world, not to put it down or on the day. Um, and I just included this picture. I was walking in the city the other day and they have this like art installations and this person sort of took that idea. It's called invasives and they use Mountain Dew bottles to sort of show the spread of plastic on this rock. So I think I like as well the idea of using what I've learned in this term in like projects that I do in the future. And then we have our crew leader, Rosa. And I thought I included her statement just because I thought it was a little different. She has taken the knowledge she's learned of non-native plants and their impacts on the surrounding ecosystem to fine tune her gardening skills in her own backyard. Uh, she said she has successfully removed mugwort from the garden, attempted to remove barberry, uh, was not successful yet. And she wants to improve her own backyard to keep the flora and fauna in the local ecosystem happy and healthy. Um, so doing her own part individually to hopefully spread a greater good. Uh, yeah, so I think the fun part about the stewards is that we are going to be out on trail Saturdays, Sundays and holidays through late October. So anyone hiking at Breakneck Bear Mountain or Croton, we will be there. We love to talk about invasives or colonialism or anything else. So that is my presentation. There we go. Uh, anyone explain the dinosaurs? Oh yeah, invasive species. They okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. There's, you can type in any dinosaur on Google and it will put it in your space. It's very exciting. <laughs> okay, next up we have uh, Minus River Gorge. Uh, Bud, you're gonna introduce your interns. Yeah, yeah thanks everyone. Um, I'm Bud Viverka, Director of Land Management at the Minus River Gorge. Um, so we have an internship program called the College Inter Internship in Suburban Ecology. And so our interns spend about 40% of their time doing research uh, projects, particularly uh, focused on uh, suburban wildlife, and then about 60% of their time working in the stewardship program. Um, their research program uh, relates to working from anywhere, doing coyote uh, camera setups in New York City and checking those, to bobcat cameras for identification, to a variety of projects where they're working on computers, uh, documenting photos, um, or doing R or other statistics to um, kind of push forward our, our research program that we have at the Maestro Gorge. Um, in the stewardship realm, uh, they have helped with everything from pulling garlic mustard to setting up fences, to anything you can think of. And then we get them opportunities such as bird banding with Bedford Audubon, um, goose banding with uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, and a number of other projects that they'll get to work on. Um, they've all joined us today. I want to quickly introduce three of our interns that won't be speaking today, um, and they'll quickly introduce themselves in their school, and then we'll move on to our two interns who are going to be speaking on uh, one of the research projects. Each student has a research project that they do throughout the summer, and they'll be wrapping those up in the next couple of weeks. So my interns. I'm Serena. Uh, I'll be graduating from Binghamton in the fall. I'm Leah. I graduated in May from George Washington University. Uh, and I'm Mac. I'm a rising sophomore at Tufts University. Okay. And then just a quick introduction of our, our other two interns. So Emily, she is our fourth member of the um, conservation in, or college internship in suburban ecology. Uh, she's a sophomore at, uh, or sorry, a senior at Oberlin College. And, uh, and so she's our, our final member there. And then Lucas came to us differently. He actually came through the Pace Resiliency Program as an intern through Pace University. And so he's actually within a different program, but we are glad to have a fifth intern, all the help we can get. Um, and they will introduce their projects that they've been working on. They're kind of two elements of the same project, but it relates back to what we've been working on in the uh, Invasive Species Prevention Zone Working Group uh, in the con priority conservation areas and how to actually survey the property so we can determine whether you have 10% invasives or not. Um, so they'll kind of elaborate on, on their project.
Okay, and you guys need to unmute. Sorry about that, a little technical difficulty. Um, so this is our project, effectively mapping invasive plants. Hit, 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 you gotta hit press on. Oh, sorry about that. I don't know why it's not working right now. And then our PowerPoint Sorry, the computer is, seems to have frozen. <laughs> yeah, the computer's frozen. <sighs> Why don't you start by introducing yourselves and maybe it will be back by the time you've finished. All right, well, I'm Lucas, like Bud said, <laughs> um, from Pace University, a rising sophomore. <laughs> um, Emily, why don't you show? Um, I'm Emily, like Bud said, from Oberlin College, going into my last year there. Um, we're going to be presenting on, <laughs> soon, <laughs> we're going enough. to be presenting on um, a method of invasive surveying that we've been doing and then how we've been put, inputting that into GIS to create a map. All right. Like you said, close it and reopen it. And All right. Yeah, go ahead and try and reopen it. Just go for it. Can you see it? Is it good? Yes. All right, great. Cool. So the goal of this project is to methodically and efficiently map and identify the prevalence and pervasiveness of invasive species on the preserved property. What we want is to have an accurate map representing the invasive is present on the property and so that we can be able to manage them and survey them. For example, right here is a patch of garlic mustard. It's extensive. So we go back or not go back now because it's all seeding, but we go back and we pull as much as we could. It just allows us to maintain the property better. We tried many methods of actually surveying. We tried line, tri line trisects or transects, right? Excuse me. And just walking the trails and seeing what was trail side. And these methods were, they were slow and they didn't effectively show us what was there. So we actually went with a quarter of an acre hexagonal plots. And these plots were large enough to actually see what was there while also being small enough that we can do them actually quite quickly. Uh, in a span of 19 days, working three days, three hours a day, we were able to complete 513 plots. This is an example of the map we use when we're actually out doing the field work. We made this map um, on our map with hexagonal tessellation and exported it as a GPS enabled PDF to the Avanza app. We all have the Avanza app on our phones and we open the app to see where we are exactly. We use the app to get to the individual hexes and then from the hexes we move to the centroids. The centroids are those little black dots in the center of each hex. From the centroid we look about 20 meters in each direction and in those 20 meters we try to find as many invasives as we possibly can and assess the abundance of the invasives. Um, we, here we have the also the contour lines and we also have the river. So we use these as kind of landmarkers when we're out doing the work, we can see where we are in relation to the altitude and the river. So this is a field data sheet we'd normally be using. It has the, the centroid as well as species code and the abundance for each species. We also have a managed and not managed section. So we, are, we know if we actually went back and did something and we need to go back and do something. We also have an additional section for any notes that might be of use while going back and managing such as if it's a steep slope or a swamp or anything <laughs> like beehives, like we've ran into a lot of beehives. So we also note that whenever we can. And these species here are not just limiting to the ones we're looking at. We're looking for any invasives we can find. These are just the ones that we know are here are the ones that we're actually targeting. If we find an invasive that's not on here, we'll just write it on the back of the sheet or write it on the bottom of the sheet. And we'll, when we're inputting the data, we'll just make a note of that. So this data then is inputted into an access file. And, and from there, from the access file, um, we want to link it with the coordinates of the hexes that's already in ArcMaps via a geodatabase. So we join those together. And then we color code for species pervasiveness. So this is an example of um, what we call management unit six, which is one of the management units that the uh, preserve is split up into. 
And you can see here like where garlic mustard, um, there's only a few of them. So zero to 5% coverage where there's some, five to 25% coverage, many, which is 25 to 50% coverage or extensive coverage, which is 50 to 100. Um, and we could use this to see how long it might take to manage an area or where we have to go. We could also see if we have to resurvey an area. So for example, um, there's extensive silk grass over here, but there is, um, we didn't find any in a hex next door. So maybe there's a stone wall there, um, but it's definitely something to go back and look at. Um, and it also, we do a similar survey method for native wildflowers. Actually, Mac um, heads that project. And um, so we can see we might want to manage more heavily in an area where there's a lot of wildflowers so they're not choked out by the invasives. And then going forward, um, the same type of surveying could be used in other units of the preserve until the whole thing is done. And then um, it actually, we could see where invasives are spreading to and how they're changing over the years. And so here, here's some pictures of us doing some of the surveys and also um, doing the burning in an area where we saw some more extensive still grass. Any questions? That's pretty cool. Um, you guys have, are doing a lot of technology as well. The, the Avenza and ArcMap and an Access Database. Good experience. Um, all right. Uh, any questions from anyone else? All right. Let's move on to Teton Lake Reservation. Natalie, uh, Natalie, you can share your screen. Also, um, you can unmute as well. All right. Can you see it? Yes. Awesome. Uh, well, hi, uh, my name is Natalie Kaivik. Um, I'm currently working at T-Town Lake Reservation um, as the meadow management crew leader. Um, I've been working here since the beginning of May, uh, managing the meadows primarily at Cliffdale Farm, um, as well as Slopes Fields and um, the Croft Meadow that's right next to the Science Center. Um, so basically, I'm going to give you an overview of um, the restoration project that's taking place here, um, as well as future projects that we like to take on. Um, so, let's see. all right. So, Clifdale is um, you know, basically uh, home to a wide variety of different native plant species um, that many birds and small animals and insects depend on for their livelihood. Um, the pictures I have here are some uh, milkweed and butterfly weed, uh, which attract pollinator species. Um, and pollination is one of the many important actions that take place in meadows. Um, and our meadow management here is crucial for ensuring that those actions take place. Um, so why is meadow management important? Um, basically, uh, meadows can be referred to as early succe successional habitat, uh, meaning that it's in the primary stages of development back into a forest um, where there are mostly herbaceous forbs, grasses, some small shrubs. Um, however, our goal is for the meadow to stay in this stage and not develop into a forest um, since this type of ecotone serves as critical nesting habitat for birds and small animals. And um, by protecting the health and development of the meadow, we also help to protect the species that rely on it for rearing their young and hiding from predators. Um, so for similar reasons, preserving meadows encourages the presence of pollinator and migratory species. Um, a popular example of this is, um, you know, making sure milkweed is present and thriving in the meadows for monarch butterflies to feed on. Um, another example is growing and maintaining um, native wildflowers for bee populations. Um, and lastly, uh, meadows are an incredible display of biodiversity, especially uh, when the flowers are in bloom. 
So this plays an important role in fostering public appreciation. Um, a passerby who observes the beauty of a well-preserved meadow is more likely to respect and admire it and subsequently want it to stay there. So perhaps that might inspire them to tell people about the meadow um, and perhaps even volunteer, volunteer their own time uh, to help manage it. Um, so that's, that's our end goal here is to have a well-preserved meadow that um, not only is servicing the local fauna, um, but also, you know, people who observe it and um, want it to stay there and want to help out with it. Um, they can, you know, it can promote uh, civil uh, science projects and or citizen science projects and stuff like that. Um, so the goals for this season um, mostly have been uh, managing the invasive species that we have here. We have um, Oriental Photinia and Black Swallowwort, along with a bunch of other ones, but those are our main threats right now. Um, you know, with, with the help of my supervisor, uh, Rebecca Policello, and my coworker, Kevin Stern, uh, we've come up with a bunch of goals um, that we hope will be incorporated into the field seasons to come. Um, so the picture on the right shows a map of Cliffdale Catamount Meadows. Um, and I, in my like beginning weeks here, um, kind of zoned out the different sections of the meadows um, and lettered them A through L. Um, and basically each zone uh, was surveyed to assess its health status. Um, that is how much of the area is invaded, um, the amount of biodiversity, and if it's starting to develop into a young forest again. Um, there are also records from previous years of the different types of plant species in each zone, as well as their respective abundance. Um, and these records help us manage our time and effort efficiently by uh, prioritizing certain zones that are in worse shape than others. Um, and uh, as I have bulleted here, like there are uh, other projects that we have that I'll I'll get into, but basically we've um, been trying to create transition zones between the meadows and the forests, um, you know, thinning out the invade, invasive species there and planting natives uh, in their place and, um, you know, continuing to map out areas and come up with future plans for uh, management. Um, so like I said, uh, our biggest threats to the Cliffdale Meadows are Oriental Photinia and Black Swallowwort um, for two different reasons. Um, Black Swallowwort is invading the interior of the meadows, um, so it's posing a threat to um, our beloved native species such as milkweed and, and dogbane and others, um, and left untreated this you know, the swallowwort vine will grow long enough to strangle these plants um, and cover the ground. And of course, we don't want that to happen. Um, so we've been monitoring our populations um, in different sections. They're not too big. <laughs> so we're hoping that um, through our management, um, they don't get any bigger, they get smaller. Um, alternatively, the photinia is posing a threat um, to the forest edges. Um, and I have more about that on the next slide. So this picture that I took um, is a really good representation of just the amount of work that um, my coworker Kevin and I have been doing the past month and a half pretty much. Um, so the Photinia mainly, uh, I mean, there's some other invasives tier four invasives that are mixed in there, um, has been creating this dense hedgerow um, right on the, on the forest edge. Um, and this is creating a big problem for us because it's um, causing an abrupt transition from the meadows into the forest. Um, and this is a problem for many reasons. Um, one 
is it increases predation. Um, so without a softer transition zone where there would be, you know, some small shrubs and such, um, if there's just a, a, an abrupt transition from, you know, a field into the forest, the small animals that are in the, the meadows um, will be easier to spot by predators um, from, you know, kind of hanging out in the forest edge. Um, so that will increase predation. Um, it also decreases biodiversity um, for obvious reasons. And it also fails to protect the forest. Um, so having that buffer uh, section between the meadows and the forest actually serves to protect the forest just as much as it protects the meadows. Um, Cause it, uh, the, you know, the shrubs protect from harsh wind and sun um, hitting against the forest edge. Um, so this, uh, this section on the left is so, so far what we have cleared out in terms of the dense brush um, with the Botinia and other species. Um, we've been cutting and using uh, an electric hedge trimmer and loppers and any, any tool we can get our hands on basically to clear out um, as much of the brush as we can um, down to the ground if we can pull out the roots even better. Um, and we're just trying to create um, space so that we can plant um, native species there to create this transition zone that we're after. So the section on the right shows that the untouched area, um, it's, it's pretty bad. So um, if you can imagine, the left side looked like the right at the beginning of all of this. So we've been working really, really hard uh, in super hot and humid weather. So it's been quite, quite a time, but obviously uh, we can see the fruits of our labor just with this picture. Um, so this is kind of like a, our, our progress photos. There's me on the right with an electric hedge trimmer um, trying to just whack things down. Um, the left picture is basically untouched. Um, I was just kind of wading through brush and getting stabbed by barberry and multiflora rose. Um, and then the middle picture shows um, there is like a huge uh, tree fall and, um, you know, we, we don't really have anyone to come in uh, who's licensed to chainsaw things. So my coworker Kevin and I literally hand sawed that tree down. <laughs> it took forever, but we, we got it done. Um, and now there's all of that, you know, clear space um, and in the fall, we're hoping to um, plant native plant species there. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, basically, I, I mapped out our treatment area. In that section alone, we uh, cleared out about 5,500 square feet. So we were pretty proud of ourselves for that. Um, so alternatively, uh, another project that we've been doing is uh, seeding some bare fields. So back in April, um, we, well, I was not here, but um, they cleared out a bunch of trees that were kind of lining um, the path in front of the entrance to Cliffsdale and trees that had um, kind of blocked off um, two sections of meadows. Um, so they, they cleared those out and left these bare fields uh, in hopes of um, creating more continuous meadow. So um, our project has been um, seeding these bare fields, just getting some native um, seed mix and raking it into the ground and hoping that it will <laughs> germinate. Um, we were having some issues though for a while, especially back in um, late May and early June. 
because uh, it was not raining a lot at all. So nothing was germinating, nothing wanted to come up. Um, so we were a little worried for a while, but um, my coworker, Kevin, um, he has background in irrigation. And uh, I was like, what, what can we do if we can't rely on rainfall? So we kind of rigged up this system of uh, basically 900 feet of tubing, of polytube, um, hooked up a, like a fan sprinkler and basically garden style, like sprinkled water onto the fields. And it actually worked. Um, stuff has started to germinate and pop up and we're really excited about it because we're starting to see, you know, um, the meadows start to connect uh, to one another now. Um, so, you know, even if it's a very simple uh, primitive irrigation system, um, it did work for us. Uh, and that's great because we didn't have to, you know, spend too much money or um, there's not a lot of effort that has to go into it besides just turning the water on and moving the sprinkler to different sections of the field to get watered. So um, that's basically it for that. Um, so our long-term goals are hopefully to eradicate the black swallower and the botinia. Um, we have uh, partnered with ISF in the past um, for T-Town to treat stuff. So we're hoping um, possibly they can come back um, and help us treat um, the photinia at Cliffdale. So um, one of my projects right now is just mapping that out um, and getting a full idea of just how bad the infestation is um, so we can send that proposal over. Um, and you know, each year just continuing to work on these transition zones, um, you know, clearing out the dense brush, planting natives in, you know, the open spaces there, um, and just maintaining that uh, year to year. Um, mowing definitely helps with that, but that's, you know, that's beyond my capabilities. Someone else does that. We bring in a person um, to mow for us, but we have to wait. Um, for the nesting season to be over in order to do that. Um, so in the meantime, you know, I'm out there just kind of manually cutting things down. Um, and, you know, in doing so, hopefully in the future years, we see, you know, more um, rare or less common native species um, of fauna um, as we plant more rare and less common native flora. So um, that's, you know, there's that connection there. And also just creating more, more continuous meadow. Um, right now, the different zones are, are kind of these parcels um, that have some disconnect. So we're hoping to take down more trees um, and, you know, tall shrubs and anything that's separating the fields, um, clear that out and make sure that the meadows connect with one another. Um, and hopefully, you know, in the years to come, we'll just have like one giant meadow. So that, that, is, that is the end goal here. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Natalie. It sounds like some great restoration projects going on over there. Um, Next up is uh, Ecological Research Institute, Arden Blumenthal. Um, Arden, do you want to share your screen and unmute? Yep. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the time. Also, um, before you get started, I'm just putting something in the chat, everyone. If you are joining from uh, with multiple other people, please put names in the chat uh, just so I can have an accurate count. OK, Arden, you have the floor. Okay. All right, so um, this summer I've been, starting in June, I've been working um, as a lingering ash intern for um, MAMA, which an intern has already mentioned is the uh, Monitoring Managing Ash um, Program, which is directed by the Ecological Research Institute, and my position is um, 
generously funded by the Orange Ripe Foundation. Um, so I know I've met many of you, um, most of you. My name's Arden. I um, graduated in 2016 from Virginia Tech um, with a degree in biochem and then um, got my master's in 2020 from Purdue in ecology and evolutionary bio. And before I was finished with my master's, I actually started volunteering for the trail conference um, as the uh, conservation dogs program intern. And I, I guess I did such a good job. They um, decided to pay me. So <laughs> um, I've been working as the conservation dogs program um, assistant and now coordinator um, since 2019. Um, and throughout my career, I guess you could say, I've worked with a variety of species, um, both invasives and natives. Um, with the conservation dogs program, we work um, with not just plants, but also um, the spotted lantern fly and um, the uh, fungus oak wilt has crossed our path. Um, so um, I have a bit of experience with, with everything. Um, this summer though, I uh, have this little uh, side internship with Mama. And for those of you who don't know, um, the monitor monitoring and managing um, ASH, ASH projects um, are, um, they, pr they provide action items for each stage of the uh, emerald ash borer invasion. Um, so ranging from before emerald ash borer has uh, entered an area to um, early infestation through late infestation. Um, and um, in addition to that, they provide guidance for ash, ash tree management. So um, a lot of managers are wondering um, if or when to cut ash trees. Um, and um, most importantly, MAMA has set up these three community science projects um, and the uh, community can participate in these from June through September, which is when uh, ash trees have leafed out. Um, the first and the most basic is the ash and emerald ash borer survey, um, which is basically just gauging what the level of emerald ash borer infestation is in an area. Um, the second is a monitoring plot network, uh, which I will go over and um, also the lingering ash search. And I will be um, mainly involved in the lingering ash search, but I'll um, also be doing the monitoring plot network this summer. So um, the monitoring plot network, uh, the goal of, of the specific project is to um, basically um, find the threshold of mortality. So how many, um, what percentage of ash trees uh, have died um, so that the remaining ash trees can be more easily found. So those are the lingering ash. Um, and um, the, the monitoring plots will also um, in, inform um, ash management decisions based on what's actually happening locally with the emerald ash borer related mortality. Um, so for the monitoring plot, um, I know a um, couple interns have already talked about uh, what they're doing for this. Um, you have to pick a minimum of 40 trees um, uh, that have to be naturally occurring ash and um, you basically monitor, monitor them throughout time. The important thresholds of mortality are 50% and 95%. Um, and um, depending on where you are um, in the region, you might have already passed the 50% um, threshold. Um, but the 95% threshold, mortality threshold is um, super important because that's um, what we use to designate whether um, a, a lingering ash search um, can take place. So um, this is mainly what I, what I'm doing this summer. Um, I am surveying areas with 95% ash mortality, mortality and I'm finding the healthy ash trees. So um, that's um, mainly determined by their um, kind of canopy health score, um, which um, I can go over if anyone wants to talk about that later if you want to get involved. But um, 
for the purpose of this, we'll just skip right on through. So I record some things like how, <laughs> what the diameter of the tree is, what um, what tail score is, um, what the health of the surrounding ash trees are, if there are any surrounding ash trees, take a G GPS location and um, inform the land manager so that we make sure that they don't cut the ash tree down. Um, and the reason why we are putting so much effort into surveying for these remaining ash trees. Um, I mean, most of you, if not all of you know, hear about um, the emerald ash borer and how it's killed hundreds of millions of ash trees um, across the United States um, and is found now in 35 states, including um, also in five Canadian provinces. So um, it's pretty widespread. Um, so the goal of finding the ashes that are left um, is so that we can uh, hopefully collect scions or clippings um, from these remaining ash trees and they can be used in, uh, they can be grafted um, and used um, basically to breed resistant ash trees. Um, research is being done to understand what exactly the mode of resistance is for these ash, but it's important to find as many as we possibly can so we can um, preserve that uh, genetic diversity in whatever um, you know res resistant, resistant ash trees we find. Um, and then I will quickly show you where exactly I'm working. Um, this map I'm is sure found not seeing the screen. Oh shoot! What are you seeing? Still the PowerPoint? We're not seeing your PowerPoint. We're just seeing you talk. Wait, what? Yeah. Oh no. Okay. Well, that was probably pretty fast then. I guess that didn't work. Here we go. I'll show you the pictures. <laughs> we'll go back up to the top. I'll show you the pictures and then I can show you the map of where, where I'm working. How come I can't move my screen now? It says you started screen sharing. Um, did you, you have to select the window you want to show? Yeah, I did. Okay. That's what I did last time yeah. too. So I thought I was, okay, did that work? Yeah. Okay, my computer froze. My internet's super spotty because uh, my partner also works from home. So that could have been the reason why. Um, well, that's me, hi. <laughs> Um, this is a recent photo of me actually finding a lingering ash. Um, so far, this project, I've found four lingering ash so far. So it's um, it's really encouraging. Um, and this is me recording um, a nearby ash tree, uh, the nearby ash trees to the healthy lingering ash. Um, I guess you can't really see it, but um, you can kind of see faint lines of the serpentine galleries from the emerald ash borer up here where my mouse is. And this is me taking the um, diameter measurement. Um, this is the emerald ash borer um, distribution map. And then, um, like I said, I will show you where the lingering ash zones are. And this is found on the uh, MAMA website. Um, this is the lower Hudson prism is drawn in blue, that, uh, that outline. And the 95% um, mortality of ash is um, not right up here. Map. <laughs> okay, let me, oh, I have to click which screen, okay. Pause share. There we go. Sorry, y'all. There you go. Okay. So the uh, the outline of blue is the Lower Hudson Prism. Um, you can see there's one small spot here of 95% mortality um, by West Point, but the majority of it is uh, up here around Kingston. Um, that's where I do most of my lingering ash surveys. However, um, I do plan on creating a monitoring plot um, with um, 
the War and Trade Foundation that um, is in um, uh, Fawn Stock State Park. So um, I will go back to the PowerPoint now <laughs> so I can tell you some things that I've learned. Um, so the reality is that I did not know um, anything about um, the effort to um, save the ash tree. Um, so this was incredibly fascinating to me and, um, and really got me excited because I, I had known previously about what was um, the efforts that were being done to save um, the American chestnut. Um, but I feel really optimistic about what we're doing here with ash because um, we're doing it a lot sooner and um, there we're we're surveying these areas um, right as they're hitting 95% mortality and monitoring areas that um, don't have don't even have that yet so um, we're really on top of it. Um, and I learned what the definitive signs of emerald ash were are of course I've seen these before, um, but um, didn't attribute them to emerald ash borer, um, I guess because it, it's been around for quite a while now. So um, the serpentine galleries, I also learned that um, there are native ash borers. So um, to be able to tell the difference between the emerald ash borer um, galleries and the, the natives. Um, and um, here are some pictures of possible emerald ash borer signs. These pictures are not mine, by the way. Um, the flaking um, from woodpeckers um, trying to take out borers. Um, obviously, the poor canopy health, um, the signs of stress like these cracks. Um, and um, the epicormic shoots. So you can see in this tree that also has the flaking. Oops. Um, all signs of tree stress, um, which um, I also learned could, you know, indicate other problems with the tree, like ash yellows, not necessarily ash borer. So um, it was um, great to put all these things together, things that I've noticed, obviously, being outside, but um, they create a picture, like a more complete picture when they're put together. Um, so, yeah, I think that's I think that's it. Oh, obviously, should have went over this first. The first thing I learned was actually how to identify an ash. So, <laughs> and this is a lovely picture of an ash with the um, opposite branching. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, most of the things that I have on here are resources that MAMA provides directly. So if you go to monitoringash.org, um, you can find these resources. And if you're interested in creating your own monitoring plot, um, you can definitely do that. All right, thank you, Arden. Um, everyone, we're, uh, we're running behind, so I'm going to modify the schedule a bit. Um, right now, we were supposed to start the open floor tier two, and I do not want to shortchange any of our intern presentation and uh, seasonal presentation. So I'm going to move the open floor tier two after the aquatic invasive strike force crew projects. We'll do the invasive strike force crew projects with Cassidy and her crew next right now. So Cassidy, if you guys want to get prepared to share your screen and it does look like we are going to run out of time to do the breakout groups. And I know everybody was really looking forward to that, um, but it, I do not want to cut any of our present presenters. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we'll try to stick that in at some other future meeting, uh, the, these discussions for the breakout groups, but that's going to fall off the schedule at this point. Um, so. Upcoming invasive strike force crew projects, then aquatic invasive strike force crew projects, and then open floor tier two. Uh, we'll, we will try to end at four if possible. Um, but if we are still talking um, at four, we may go a little bit over. Okay. All right, uh, Cassidy, go ahead. 
Hi, can everybody see my screen? Yes, uh, but we're not seeing a presentation. We're seeing the um, PowerPoint. Yeah, there you go. Great. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Cassidy. Uh, I'm the crew leader for the Invasive Strikes Force uh, Terrestrial. Um, Tim and I are gonna be talking about our progress this season. Uh, so here's a brief introduction to the Strike Force so that for those of you uh, who may not know. Uh, we're all AmeriCorps members doing a service term with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference uh, as part of the Conservation Corps. Uh, and we have three main objectives that we focus on throughout the season. Uh, our number one objective uh, is to focus on tier two emerging invasive species. Uh, for these species that are brand new to the region, early detection and rapid response are critical, and we're part of the rapid response. We work to meet regional goals of eradication and preventing the spread of new and existing invasives. Uh, our second objective uh, is outreach and education. We do volunteer uh, work days in which we train volunteers to identify and save of invasives. In general, these foster stewardship and a sense of pride and ownership in one's own local environment and make people want to get involved and become uh, trail surveyors or volunteer leaders. Our third objective uh, is to meet local conservation concerns. Uh, and often we manage widespread invasive species at the request of our project partners. We do this in order to meet local conservation goals such as protecting unique and rare habitats, endangered species, and protected species. So uh, here are some of our, um, here are all of the tier two uh, invasives that we work with. So far this season, we've managed in sized few more, sticky sage, scotch broom, Chinese bush clover, paper mulberry, cutleaf blackberry, giant hogweed, pale swallowwort, and sapphire berry. Uh, in Kazu, chocolate vine, Japanese spirea, hardy kiwi, and castor aurelia. Uh, and now we're going to move into talking about some of our uh, emerging tier two invasives projects. Uh, so first is sticky sage, salvia glutinosa. Uh, this is an herbaceous plant in the mint family originating in Europe and Western Asia that was originally planted ornately. Long petioles, leaves, ground serrations on the leaves, and yellow flowers in late summer. This is a very high priority project for us uh, because of its limited distribution in only two known locations in the state, Dover and Pound Ridge, New York. Uh, there are populations along the Appalachian Trail, uh, which is a critical pathway for spread and dispersal if left untreated, as it can adhere to hikers and animals with its sticky seeds and spread up and down the East Coast. To ensure thorough management, the conservation dogs team also pre-scouts to delineate borders of the infestation and revisit sticky sage sites to quality check for missed plants. Thus far this season, um, using a foliar spray of glyphosate over eight days, we've managed 17,378 sticky sage over 44.17 acres. Uh, and we're returning for four more days to work towards full eradication. Uh, on the left, you can see one of our crew members, Christian, standing in a giant monoculture of sticky sage. Uh, it's really widespread in this spot, as you can see, uh, and it's dominating the forest floor and uh, preventing those native species from thriving. And on the right, you can see a sticky sage uh, three weeks of treatment, um, and you can tell how effective it is by the uh, dead leaves. Uh, next, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren to speak about more of our emerging invasives projects. All right, uh, so hi, I'm Lauren, uh, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, two other major tier two species we've been treating. The first one being giant hogweed. Uh, so this large seven to 14 foot max tall plant um, typically has a white umbel or umbrella shaped flower, um, just as some of the key features it has. Uh, originally it's native to Eurasia in the um, uh, Caucasus Mountains, uh, but it was introduced to North America in 1917. Um, and currently within the prism, uh, there are 16 properties across Dutchess, Putnam, Orange, and Westchester County that we've been treating. Um, and hogweed's removal is absolutely critical because as we know, the sap can cause severe chemical sunburns, um, which is why we've been working hard in conjunction with the DEC uh, for its treatment and eradication. And so far over the course of the three days that we've had to work with it, we've managed uh, 7,115 individuals in total. 
All right. And just to kind of show you on the left, um, uh, borrowed from the DEC website, uh, is its range map across uh, New York State. And circled in the right hand corner there is its presence uh, currently in the Lower Hudson Prism. All right. And uh, in addition to these, uh, Scotch broom was another major species that we are still working on. Uh, we have another uh, couple days uh, later in August where we're going to be working with it. Uh, but this dense shrub typically has a square stem with uh, three hairy leaflets directly attached to the stem. Uh, and it's native to Europe and was introduced ornamentally and for erosion control. Um, and within the prism, these plants have been found across Harriman and Bear Mountain, typically. Um, and it creates aggressive, dense monocultures. Uh, and because it's a legume, it changes the soil chemistry. And so far, we've treated uh, 8,787 individuals, uh, but plans to return to completely treat other sites are being made. All right, and here's a couple pictures of Scotch broom, uh, but here in the middle uh, was really interesting, at least to me, because it shows off the leaves really well and it's immature fruit. Um, but later on when the fruit matures, it turns black and will like burst open, allowing seeds to easily spread uh, to the surrounding area. Uh, now Christian is going to talk about some of our volunteer education outreaches. Hi, I'm Christian. Uh, to help reach our second objective of outreach and education, the ISF has helped establish a native restoration site in Harriman with a Korean youth Buddhist group. For this site, the group wanted to have a location where their efforts can be seen in the years to come. Here in the site, we manage general invasives such as Oriental Bittersweet, Multiflora Rose, and Barberry. We also have, we're graced with the presence of a tier two species such as Scotch Broom. <laughs> in this site, we managed a total of 1,850 plants of those plants managed being scotch broom and such we have some photos of the volunteer work day over here we have cassidy our crew leader helping plant bone set seeds in the middle is a group photo and to the right is lauren teaching a uh, plant id to the volunteers so continuing on fulfilling our uh, goal of talking about outreach and education objectives, we held a volunteer event in Black Rock Forest where we dealt with similar general widespread invasives during the New York Invasive Species Awareness Week, I saw. We also were blessed with the opportunity to help with installing a boot brush station. And here are some photos of the volunteer event and our crew member, Melissa, helping with installation of it. And now Melissa will be talking about projects relating to local conservation concerns. Hi everybody, my name is Melissa. Um, the ISF crew has also had the opportunity with some partners on a variety of local conservation projects. And these projects seek to protect some unique and threatened species in the area. Um, one of our most interesting projects was the Great Swamp, which was in Dutchess County. And here we partnered with the Friends of the Great Swamp to remove some widespread species. Um, the reason that we decided to focus on some widespread species here was to open the canopy and pr promote native shrub populations in order to enhance a young forest exceptional habitat for the federally listed New England cottontail population. And this site is also special because it also has a marble bedrock, which is high in calcium and creates a high pH soil and groundwater. Um, and this encourages some specialized plants to grow there, such as round leaf ragwort, which is also the host for um, the glo globally rare species, the Northern Meadowmark butterfly. And over the course of two days here, the ISF crew managed 823 plants. The ISF crew also had the opportunity to work on emerging tier two species, cutleaf blackberry and Chinese bush clover, as well as some um, widespread invasives at Iona Island. And Iona Island is um, really special because it's close to the public and it's an active life sanctuary located in Stony Point. And this island is also a designated national natural landmark and it serves as a bird sanctuary and also large population of native Eastern, Eastern prickly pear cacti. And over the course of two days, the ISF managed um, 1,523 plants. 
And finally, the crew also had the opportunity to manage some more tier two species, Chinese bush clover and paper mulberry, as well as um, tier three species, sycamore maple at Croton Point. And Chrome Point Park is an Audubon important bird area, and it was also designated a biodiversity reserve. And this site has become a vital stopping point for migrating birds and a breeding habitat for um, special species, the grasshopper sparrow and the bobo link, and also the golden northern bumblebee can be found here. So over the course of two days, the ISF crew had managed 705 plants here. And now I'll pass it off to Joe, who will go over some upcoming projects for ISF. Hello everyone, I'm Joe. I'm just going to touch on a few of our current and ongoing projects. So first up is sapphire berry. Um, this is a tree that can grow up to 40 feet. Its name um, is embodied in the intense blue fruit that it produces and you can see in the picture on the right. Uh, it also has very rough leaf texture from trichomes. So we've done a little bit of work so far uh, with Sapphire Berry. Uh, we had a couple days last week that we worked in Carolyn's Grove and Saks Park, and we managed about 580 uh, Sapphire Berry trees there. Um, it's a tier two in the lower Hudson Valley. It's native to East Asia. Um, it's a threat to our native plants here because it creates monocultures and it changes soil composition. And we treat it with the basal bark method using a triclopyr based pesticide. Uh, we actually will be out with the Vassar College interns uh, this weekend and we're looking forward to uh, work with sapphire berry and another plant that we'll get to in just a moment. Next is kudzu uh, that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, the vine that ate the south and it's moving up north right now. It's a climbing perennial vine, um, grows up to 100 feet long and can even grow up to 60 feet in a season. Another issue with it is uh, it has massive deep tap roots that make, make it a pain to um, pull up. And so that's why we will be treating it with the uh, cut stump method using uh, glyphosate or triclopyr. Oh, hold on one second. There we go. Um, it's a tier two uh, for now, and we wanna keep it that way and, or move it back to a tier one or complete eradication. Right now is our moment to uh, really really grasp it and uh, prevent it from growing farther into the north. Um, it's widespread currently in the southeastern US. Um, it's an issue because it has rapid dense growth. It covers and prevents growth of native, native trees and it girdles and weighs down trees. Uh, we have four days planned uh, to work with kudzu in October in the southern region of the lower Hudson Valley down near New Rochelle, North Bronx area. Finally is Castor Aurelia um, that we'll be working on this weekend with Vassar. Um, it's a large flowering deciduous shade tree. Um, it's five to seven lobe uh, leaves are really notable, um, make it easy to identify. Um, it's a tier two and it's native to Eastern Asia. Uh, it was cultivated as an ornamental in the United States in the 1870s and just recently uh, escaped. Uh, it casts dense shade, uh, reducing sunlight for native plants. Um, we treat it with the basal bark method uh, using a triclopyr based uh, pesticide. And as I said before, we'll be working on it this week um, at Vassar. And then we have one more day planned in September. And that about does it for our slides. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments, feel free to email us at the email on the screen. And um, there we go. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, uh, Invasive Strike Force crew. Yay. Next up is the Aquatic Invasive Strike Force crew. Um, guys, please don't short change your presentation. Please give us the full presentation, even if we go over time. Um, so, Maya, are you uh, going to share your screen? Yes, can Cassidy unshare hers? <laughs> you should be able to. Okay. <laughs> One second. Can everybody see that? Yes, that's good. 
Okay, perfect. So we're the Aquatic Invasive Strike Force crew. My name is Maya Thompson. I'm the leader for this season. Um, I'm going to jump right into it, and the other crew members will be sure to introduce themselves when they get to their slides. So a little bit of background. We're all here because of the main problem, which is invasive species. Specifically for us, of course, we're dealing with aquatic invasive species. There are over 150 aquatic invasive species in the Hudson River alone that have the potential to cause harm to the environment, economy, and human health. But documentation of these species have pre has previously been scant, and without knowing the full distribution and degree of establishment of them, managers are unlikely to be able to efficiently manage. So that's sort of where we come in. The Aquatic Invasive Strike Force crew aims to bridge the gap in this knowledge and assist in early detection and rapid response efforts of both aquatic invasive plants and invertebrates. So what we do, we perform aquatic vegetation surveys on high priority water bodies to gain data on the presence, absence, and density of native and invasive plants. So we use a modified point intercept survey using the rake toss method. Essentially what this means is that we overlay a 60 by 60 meter grid to select one survey point per acre, like you can sort of see in this example from Seven Hills Lake. We navigate to each point via handheld GPS and we perform two rake tosses per point and record what we find. So you can see in this picture, crew member Claire um, pulled up what looks like native coontail on her rake. We also record water quality, such as pH, conductivity, alkalinity, hardness, temperature, phosphate, and nitrate. A lot of aquatic invasive species have variable tolerances, so this data might help predict future invasions and habitat suitability. We also do zooplankton sampling, um, we, so we do plankton toes using a plankton net, and we, we're using this to monitor specifically for the invasion of the spiny water flea. Likewise, we do macroinvertebrate sieve surveys. So we sample shallow areas focusing on Asian clam, New Zealand mud snail, and mystery snails. And last but not least, we manage and analyze data. So at the end of the season, we'll report to water body stakeholders and we'll also enter everything into IMAP invasives. So our survey data so far, we've surveyed 19 water bodies, including lakes, ponds, and rivers. We're focusing more on rivers this year, um, which we previously haven't. So that's really exciting that we've gotten to do a few. We've um, surveyed um, just over 1,200 acres. We found eight aquatic invasive plants and invertebrates, and we submitted almost 800 observations. These are just a few of the places we've been. Um, I mapped them all out. Only some labels came up. But um, for example, we've been to Lake Duchess, Palmer Lake, Lake Sagamore, um, Ponds and Baxter Preserve, Twin Island Lake, Seven Hills Lake, Lake Maritanza, the Harlem River, and the Mayanus River Gorge. And these are just some fun pictures I've included. So typically we survey using canoes or kayaks like you can see in a few of these pictures, but we have used waders. Um, this is us at Manus River Gorge and we used um, the waders to walk in some chest deep water, which is fun. Um, but when we do rake tosses, sometimes we pull up nothing. Sometimes we pull up um, a lot of plants or invertebrates like you can see in the picture all the way to the right. So in terms of aquatic invasive species found, like I had mentioned, we found eight. We found Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, water chestnut, European water clover, Chinese mystery snail, banded mystery snail, fanmort, and brittle naiad. And I'm gonna pass it off to Kaylee. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee. Um, so for those of you who don't know, water chestnut is a tier three invasive species that is established in the lower Hudson Valley. And you can see the picture up on the top over here. That's what it looks like. It has um, triangular serrate floating leaves that are arranged in rosettes. And each rosette has sharp four horn nutlets that allow it to spread. And they can produce, one rosette can produce up to 20 rosettes. I mean, sorry, 20 nutlets. Um, and it mainly can spread through boats, animals, humans, and waterways. But luckily, young individual populations may have the potential for eradication or suppression if the rosettes are removed before the seeds drop in August. So that's why the whole month of July, we've been removing water chestnut. So, so far, we have removed over 82,000 plants. We've removed over 8,000 plants of 8,000 pounds of plants. Um, and we want to thank our 29 volunteers for their awesome hard work. And we've had 
270 hours of effort as well. And so far we've been to eight sites, but we have about two weeks left. So we're excited for that. Um, so these are a few of our sites. Uh, the first picture on the left is Rockland Lake. And uh, on this day, the terrestrial ISF crew came out with us, which was cool. And we've been here twice this season. Uh, and the picture in the middle is crew member Claire holding up a handful of water chestnut at Constitution Marsh. And this was on the Hudson River, uh, which has way too much water chestnut to feasibly remove, but we were focusing on this area to help protect the population of water celery. And we've been here twice as well. And then the picture all the way to the right is Blue Mountain Reservation, um, which we went to for three days in a row, I believe. And finally, the Putnam County Veterans Memorial Park is a water chestnut success story. So there was 21,000 plants removed in 2019 and 2,850 plants removed the following year. And this year we only removed 160 plants. So as you can see from the before and after pictures each year, it slowly decreased in population. And now we have found not as much, which is really awesome. And now I'm gonna hand it off to you, Suga. Um, hi, I'm Suba. I'm going to be speaking to you about the Watercraft Inspection Steward Program. Um, so boating is a huge pathway for invasive or aquatic invasives to spread. Um, plant fragments, invertebrates, um, we call them aquatic hitchhikers. Um, they can latch on to boats and fishing equipment. Um, so part of the goal of the program is to inform boaters and fishermen of aquatic invasive species, um, as well as how like the preventative measures that they can take to prevent the spread of them. Um, so we station ourselves at three boat launches along the Hudson. Um, so Peak Skills Waterfront Green Park, Slatesburg's Municipal Launch, and Haverstraw Bay County Park. Um, so we'll greet boaters and fishermen. We'll talk to them about um, the aquatic invasive species present in the water bodies, um, the different measures that they can take to help prevent the spread. And we'll also guide them through an inspection. Um, so we've been fortunate that most of the people we encounter are well aware of aquatic invasives and they're already taking the preventative measures they can. Um, we preach clean, drain, dry. Um, so we just ask everyone to wash their boats thoroughly, drain everything and let them dry in the sunlight um, for a few days. Um, and there have only been three occasions where we've actually found aquatic hitchhikers. So that was Eurasian water mill foil um, twice at Slatesburg and then water chestnut at Haverstraw. Um, so we've inspected over 200 watercrafts and reached over 400 people. Um, and next, I'm just going to be talking to you about some of the um, other things we'll be doing in the future. So we do still have a couple of weeks of water chestnut removals. Um, so Tibbetts Brook Park is the next site we'll be going to. Um, we'll, we'll also be working with Westchester Parks, which we work with at um, Blue Mountain Reservation. Um, and then a couple more lakes and creeks. And then starting August, we'll be going back to surveys. Um, a lot of it will be returning to sites we've been at and just removing anything else that we missed. Um, and next, I will pass it on to Claire. Hi, I'm Claire and I'm gonna talk about social media. So our social media presence has been an essential tool for education and awareness. Every Saturday, the crew posts an update on the Trail Conference Conservation Corps Instagram with an update on what we've been doing that week. This season, we have reached 1,079, or we've received 1,079 likes, and we've reached 6,144 people. Um, a new segment that we've started this year is the Aquatic Invasive Species in 60 Seconds video series. Um, and here is the video that we posted for June. I'm Claire, and this is Aquatic Invasive Species in 60 Seconds. This is Carly Pond. 
Curly leaf pondweed was likely introduced to North America in the mid 1800s, intentionally planted for waterfowl and wildlife habitats. Although native to Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia, it is now found throughout North America. Curly leaf pondweed can be recognized by its lasagna like weedy leaves that are found submerged in water. Growing three to five inches in length, these leaves can be green or reddish brown. Curly leaf pondweed reproduces primarily through turions and rhizomes. Turions are hardened, dormant reproductive shoot segments that sprout in the fall. They grow slowly in the winter and begin growing normally in the spring. This allows them to reach the surface before native plants. They can grow up to four inches per day and form dense canopies by early summer. Curly leaf pondweed is commonly spread between water bodies by attaching to boats, trailers, and other gear. For this invasive plant, the best management is prevention. Cleaning, draining, and drying boats and equipment with direct contact to the water will decrease the spread. Now you can help prevent the spread of this aquatic invasive and help protect New York waters. Thanks for watching. And we'd like to thank all of our PRISM partners who have collaborated with us so far and have allowed us to complete this work. Thank you. Thank you, Aquatic Invasive Strike Force. Great work. And thank you, everyone, for hanging with us. Uh, obviously, our agenda went way over time, uh, uh, and we had to cut some of the things on the end. Um, but everything has been recorded, so anybody that had to leave early will be able to watch this. And uh, we are going to cut also the open floor. Uh, we'll do that via email with PRISM Partners. So I'd like to thank all of the interns that were with us today. A lot of great projects. I've gotten a lot of um, emails from, I mean, uh, chats from people. Really enjoyed uh, all of the presentations. And I also noticed that we kept uh, a very high attendance throughout the whole meeting. Uh, so I just goes to show that a lot of people were very interested in everything that we are presenting today. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Great meeting, and we'll talk to you next time. Uh, goodbye, everyone.